an area known as the Greater Kruger National Park and on Juma Game Reserve. It's a beautiful afternoon, nice and cool. It's a bit cloudy and overcast. We've had a lot of rain last night, so the soil is wet. The bush is very, very um, wet also from all the rain, obviously, all the vegetation. A lot of little mud wallows and pools. I'm going to sit and spend time with this elephant. Don't forget, send us your questions. Um, those in the school, ask your teachers to tweet us via hashtag Safari Live. They will send the questions through um, and we'll hopefully answer as many of them as we can. Now, I think I'm going to stay with this elephant. Let's go across to one of my friends, Ali, who would like to say good afternoon to you. Hello everyone and very warm welcome to Malibu and Pembroke schools who are joining us today on this afternoon safari. My name is Ali and on camera with me today is Senzo and we are very happy to have you guys on board. Also, just like Byron, we might be hearing some elephants in the distance. So I think they were actually busy trying to break a tree. So we're going to go and investigate and see what it is that we've got there. But by all means, if you've got any questions, please send them through via your teacher. Because we love hearing from you guys, especially if you have any interesting questions for us. Now, it sounded like a whole tree was being pushed down. And it is something that elephants do every now and again, especially when they want to get to the top part of the tree. Now, it sounded like it was somewhere around here, so we're just going to keep our eyes open for a little bit just to try and see if maybe we find the culprit. Because sometimes elephants can be very naughty and they destroy a lot of things all around us. I can't see any fallen down trees, so perhaps it was, I see an elephant now, far away in the distance. There it is, pushing down another tree. I don't know... If we're going to be able to get it from here, let me just try and off-road a little bit. <laughs> it seems like this Ellie is breaking something very, very thoroughly. Let's see. Alrighty, almost there. Let's see, elephant, what you up to? Now, I'm going to park us right here because then we're going to be able, we're not going to be able to see the elephant all that well, but we're going to see what it is that he's up to. Now, you see he's hiding behind the vegetation, behind the tree, and I think that's exactly the tree that it's already pushed down, or at least it seems it's broken half of it. There, there we go. That's the tree that died. So you see it actually broke it from very high up and I think it managed to do that because it's still a new tree. So if the elephant stretched its trunk all the way up to the branches of the tree and then pulled very quickly, maybe it, that's exactly what caused the tree to break. <gasps> oh no. We have one dead tree. This is a murder, murder scene almost. <laughs> the elephant's just broken down the whole tree just because it wanted some, probably just of the leaves at the top. It seems like the elephants prefer eating the very yummy leaves that we've got all the way at the top, probably because they are the ones that receive the most sunlight and then for the yummiest. I don't know if he's trying to break it a little bit more or if he's just now trying to eat and grab all the branches with his trunk. Cadence. Well, I can tell you that this elephant is eating a tree that's called a marula tree, but they eat all sorts of things all around here. So they will eat not only leaves from the trees, sometimes they also eat the bark. They eat tons and tons of different trees, but they also eat grass and fruit. They really like the fruit of certain trees. And now that it's the summertime and it's the rainy season, many different trees are producing fruit. And of course, they also like eating flowers. So they'll pretty much eat anything that they can. Well, as you can imagine, being such a big creature, then you've got to eat a lot. So we can only see one sneaky part of his tusk, which is that white thing that we're seeing there. And sometimes the tusks help them break the elephants, uh, the trees or the branches or other things. Seems like my friend Byron has a much better view of the elephants. So let's head over to him for a clear view of what an elephant looks like. And Ali, now we have two elephant, both enjoying the marula fruit. It's a wonderful time of year for these elephants.
Have a look. He's going to push the tree. Wow, look at the power. That's so clever. Did you see that? Amazing. They are so powerful. And he did that just to knock some of those fruit down from the tree so he can feed on them. Amazing. Sometimes I'll even push the tree over completely. But you see he's picking up the fruit at the moment. And now, Nakoya, you asked, how do elephants interact? Well, um, they're very social animals, um, mainly the, the herds. And I say the herds, and what I mean by that is the females and all the young elephant, they, um, they stay together in, in large herds, sometimes up to 60 or 80 elephant I've seen in really big herds. So very social. In this area, we mainly get herds of about um, between 10 and 20, I would say. But often the males, like we can see here, they tend to move around on their own or small groups, maybe two or three males together. And they just look for the nice vegetation, and especially these marula fruits now in the summer. We don't have them here in the winter. The trees don't give fruit in the winter, so when the marula fruit is around, then the Ellies really, really enjoy it. And Naya, I wouldn't say that the elephants camouflage very well. Uh, however, the bush is very thick at the moment. So they can blend in and surprisingly, they can disappear quite easily. Um, because there's a lot of thick vegetation, big trees, so they can hide behind them. So at times we, we may hear the elephant before we actually see them. But I wouldn't say it's camouflage. I mean, they're really... These large grey animals. Now have a look. There's some interaction that we were speaking about earlier. Um, how they can interact and are social. The bulls, there is always a, a dominance display. So one will be more dominant than the other and may chase the other one. And you can see that one on the left is definitely bigger than the one on the right. Okay, let's uh, go back to Ellie and see if she's managed to have a better view of the elephant she found. Well, we are trying to see if maybe there's another way around them, but unfortunately, just because of the angle where the elephant is, he's got trees all around him. So if, even if we try and go from the other side, it's going to be very complicated to try and see it. So look at that, the biggest animal out here in the bush, and he is one of the ones that hides the most easily. Which is a little bit crazy now that I think about it. So a very big black grayish thing just goes behind a, <laughs> a lot of green bushes and then it hides entirely. I think we're going to leave him there. Probably he's hiding because he knows he shouldn't be pushing down trees. And we're going to try and find our next animal. I'm not sure what it would be, but I am looking for a beautiful leopard that's got a tiny little cub. Well, not that tiny anymore, but still very young. And I've only managed to see it once, so I'm hoping, and so please guys send me very good luck, to make my way into the area where she was, because it was far away from where the lodge is, because obviously the leopards want privacy, and then she's going all the way there. Seems like Byron has managed to find the elephants again. <laughs> So let's head over to him for another look. <laughs> it wasn't very difficult. They haven't really moved. They're still standing. Um, and I think we seem to have the best view of them at the moment. Those beautiful big tusks. And Nish, you are wondering how long an elephant's trunk is a grown elephant now I think a big big male elephant can have a trunk oh watch look at this oh, look at that this is just a bit of playful behavior they don't look aggressive now elephants often especially these males they tend to get playful and push one another around and Nesh I'll answer your question shortly uh, trunk, a big elephant. Have a look. Sorry, there's <laughs> so much going on. Look how he's stretching that trunk to get to the branches at the top. You might try to break a branch. Possibly try to reach some fruit. Let's see if he pulls a branch down. Yeah, there we go. 
and there's another elephant approaching just left of us a younger one look at that all these elephants coming out a nation a big male elephant's trunk i think can get up to about three meters in length if i'm not mistaken um I think when they really stretch them out, I think it's almost three meters. I'll double check though, Anish. I want to make sure that I don't give you the incorrect information, but I do think it's about three meters. Now, Marley, have a look at this elephant. It's using its trunk to smell, so that's one of the main reasons they have the trunk is obviously to smell. It is their nose. Oh, look pushing each other again they also use the trunk for just about everything else feeding breaking branches picking up food breaking grass uh, drinking water they slurp the water up through their trunk and then pour it into their mouth so the trunk is a very very vital tool for the elephant I'm going to stay with these elephant. It's such a lovely sighting. Let's go across, though, quickly to Tristan, who would like to say good afternoon to you. And let's find out what his plan is. Well, I would love to say good afternoon to all of you. So a very, very warm hello from myself. Um, Fergus, as Byron mentioned, my name is Tristan. And like I said, we're Fergus on camera. But what we've got there is a African Harrier hawk also be used to be known as a gymnogene and you can see it's being blown about by the wind but this is a very cool bird these guys are such fun to watch because they often are flying around they don't sit still for too long and what they do is they fly from tree to tree and you see that they've got very long legs without feathers now those long legs without feathers are their weapons and so what they do is they fly from tree to tree and they'll grab on the side and then they kind of find little holes in the tree that house birds and squirrels and little mice and those kind of things and they then stick those legs in and pull them out and then when they pull them out obviously they'll then go and land and try and feed off it but there you can see it's perched in a beautiful dead tree with a beautiful big kind of sky in the background now it is a very warm welcome to the schools that have joined us this afternoon i hope that you guys will have lots and lots of fun with us and hopefully you'll ask lots of questions remember that you must just send your questions to your teacher and she'll send them all to us but that is one of my favorite birds of prey i really love spending time with them and so hopefully we're going to have a situation where it will fly a bit and maybe move around and we can follow it around they're always good to follow because they often like i say are hunting and you can then get to see some really cool things is how they kind of pull the nests out of squirrels and all kinds of other things to find food which is really quite exciting they're also quite cool because their face changes color so i want to just show you in my book quickly what i mean and it's amazing because the first time i ever saw this bird and thought that they you all know, heard that they changed their sort of color on their face i thought it was something that lasted forever and it didn't really kind of flush too easily but if you have a look here this is what this bird looks like it's a big gray bird and you can see those long legs i was talking about but you see it normally has this yellow face now when that face is yellow like this it's normally when the bird is just doing whatever it wants and just kind of flying around and hunting and it's all very calm but when it goes like this it's normally when the bird is excited and this change in color happens within a few minutes it just goes from yellow to red very quickly and it's normally when it's excited or if it's breeding or if it's trying to find another African Harrier Hawk then it will go this way which is very cool but they're easy to identify because of the big bars on the tail and gray coloration Frankie wondering how high how far and whether they migrate well Frankie they are not migratory birds so these guys are residents in this area they stay here all year round in terms of how high and how far they generally don't fly very far or very high and the reason why is because they do not hunt other birds that are flying around or hunt anything that moves too fast as I was saying when they hunt they try to go from tree to tree to try and put their feet into holes and grab prey like that so 
Generally, they fly just above the treetops and then they swoop into the trees and then they go and land at the nest and try and grab something and try and see if they've got something inside of those holes. So they're very clever in the way that they go about their business so they don't fly very high or migrate or move around too much like some of the other birds here. Now it looks like it might fly away and so while we sit and see if it does fly away, let's send you back across to Byron with the big elephants and see what they're up to. Uh, the elephants are still moving along feeding and they, uh, we're going to try to keep up with them a little bit. Getting back to the question of the, um, the elephant trunk, so it can weigh up to 400 pounds which is massive, 400 pounds and can get up to about 7 feet long. I'm trying to think what the conversion is for 7 feet uh, or feet and meters, I can't remember. I need to try and try and remember what that is. But um, I'm sure all the schools in, in America, you can understand wh how long seven feet is. Sam, I, I don't know what the, the reason an elephant male is called a bull elephant. Um, I think with large animals, most of the large animals, the males are just called bulls. I don't know um, if there's a specific reason. I don't think so because if I think of um, the many different species of antelope that we have around here, uh, the, the males, the larger antelope, the males are known as bulls. I think it's purely a herbivore term. Um, it's definitely not used in terms of predators or anything like that. So maybe just a, a large um, herbivore. If I think of, or like I say, wildebeest is a big antelope we get here. The kudu, um, the waterbuck, those are all known as bulls, the males. And buffalo is a bull. A rhino, a rhinoceros, the male is also a bull. Elephant is a bull. So I think it's a herbivore term for the large animals that we have in Africa. See them reaching up, stretching for those branches. Wonderful to see. Sabrina, a female elephant usually gives birth to one calf at a time. It's only one calf. And the amazing thing is that they are pregnant for 22 months. Isn't that an incredible? Very, very long time. So 22 months, they give birth to one calf. However, I have heard of strange situations where twins are born where two calves are born it does not happen often but it has happened in the wild before um, but usually sabrina it's only one calf i'm gonna try reposition quickly i'll just get another little view devon these elephants, um, they, they're fairly tall. They're not quite full grown. Uh, they will still grow. An elephant generally grows throughout its lifetime. And um, I think this, these elephant, uh, probably, uh, I would say, three meters tall, four, three to four meters tall at, the, at shoulder height. So they, they, they are still, I mean, that's still very, very large. But um, but they can get a little bit bigger. I'd say I'd say yeah, you know, maybe three and a half meters tall. So the the largest one, yeah. I think um, some of the others can get uh, can get uh, some of the other elephant bulls, the big ones, can get a bit taller, about four and a half meters. Um, Thomas, you asked how heavy are elephant? Uh, elephant, Thomas, a big male can get up to about five or six tons. So really, really very, very heavy. I'm just double checking in the book here. I don't want to make a mistake, but um, they say that the average height of an elephant is 
uh, between three and four meters. Yeah, I think you can get some bulls that are a little bit taller than that. But yeah, I think these ones, these ones are about three meters. Um, they they're not quite full grown. They probably can get a little bit, little bit bigger. Maybe maybe just over three meters tall. But the average elephant is about uh, three to four meters tall. Females obviously smaller than the males. The big males definitely much taller. But they are incredible that uh, they can get up to about 5,000, 6,000 kilograms or six tons. The females are a lot less, maybe three and a half tons for a big female. Solomon, that's a very good question and a very important question. You are asking how, what impact the uh, elephant have on the environment. Well, Solomon, with these elephants moving around, they obviously trample a lot of the vegetation. They push over a lot of trees, which a lot of us think um, can be or is probably destructive. However, what it does is it provides food for a lot of these smaller creatures. It can also provide um, homes for for some of the smaller animals. If this if these elephants decided to push over a tree or two, what would happen is animals like small antelope, little scrub hares, birds, snakes, they would all live inside that thicket, the, that that pushed over tree. So they, they do provide many uses for the environment. And, um, and a very important role in nature. Look at that. Look at that stretching. Using the full length of his trunk. It's, it looks about two, just over two meters. Again, I'm trying to um, think if anybody knows the conversion for meters or feet to meters. What is seven feet in meters? See, down here in South Africa, we use meters and not really feet. And I always forget the conversion. What do you see? Constantly breaking branches and that. Feeding on the marula fruit, but they do play a huge environmental role, the elephant. Okay, so about three feet in a meter, so just over two meters for the total length of a of a, a trunk. Um, yeah, just less than less than three meters, two two and a half meters for the length of a trunk for a big elephant. Kevin, the elephant don't really have many predators. I would say the only predator, and these elephant, for example, probably don't have any predators, but young elephant, the only predators would be lions. I have heard and seen lions trying to chase young elephant and hunting elephant in other parts of Africa, in, in Botswana especially, many, many elephant there. So the lions have learned to hunt them. But the younger elephant, not really the adults. Adults are very big, very powerful, so it would be difficult. And these bulls, I doubt any lion would try to catch a bull that is size. Malachi. You are curious about the ears of the elephant and you want to know why such big ears. Well, all the better to hear you with Malachi. <laughs> so Malachi, the ears actually have many different uh, um, benefits for the elephant. The one is obviously hearing. They do have an acute sense of hearing. And also, Malachi, those big ears help keep the elephant cool, believe it or not. So they don't necessarily act as a fan, but what happens is there are, there are a lot of veins, little veins that run through the ear, and the ear is very thin. So with all that blood that moves through the ear, 
if it's a hot day, the elephant flaps the ear. That allows that blood to cool down slightly and therefore helps the elephant cool down. So that blood circulates through the body and through the ear and with the flapping it cools it down slightly, not by much, but by a few degrees and that helps, um, helps manage the body temperature and regulate the body temperature. So it help keeps, help keeps it cool. The other thing they use the ears for is perhaps warning us if they feel threatened or they feel aggressive. They flap their ears very quickly. They'll raise their heads, open their ears, make themselves look bigger. So a lot of different uses for the ears of the elephant. Now that one's moved a little bit further and those have moved off. I'm going to try reposition and get an, another view. All right, now I know my friend Tristan was trying to go look for a lion this afternoon. I hope he does find him. But let's go across to him now and see where he is. Well, I'm right down on the southern side of where we drive around, and I'm trying to see if I can find a leopard at the moment. But there is no sign of the leopard just yet. Hopefully we're going to get lucky. We have to keep our eyes peeled because leopards are the shyest and most reclusive of all of the the animals which means that they are very difficult to spot they like to hide away and so it's almost like a game of hide and seek when it comes to trying to spot our spotty friends and i'm just driving around slowly because sometimes what happens with leopards is that they'll cross a road and when they cross a road they leave their little footprints and when they leave their footprints it makes it much easier for us because we know that they've been there and we can then follow those footprints and try and find them they like to hang around in very thick areas where there's lots of thick bush and where they can hide behind trees and grasses and those kind of things so that's the perfect place to look for them so areas like where we are now are very good to find a leopard so we're just going slowly 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 just trying to see if we can find anything I hope though that it'll be somewhere here. You can see there it's very thick on that side. And there was a leopard that was hanging around here a few days ago. It is a mom leopard with her baby. And so they've been moving up and down in this area. And that's why we're just going to see if I can find any footprints for either the baby or the mom. If I can find footprints for the baby, it's actually even better because we know then that mom will definitely come and try and find her baby so they've spent a lot of time in this area so i have to look very carefully ah there's actually not a leopard but there is an animal that the leopards like to eat so it's called a dacre now a dacre is a type of antelope it is indeed a dacre a little male that's got a small horn so this is a young male he hasn't quite developed and gotten very big just yet so he's like a teenager at the moment but his horns will not get too much bigger and he himself will not get too much bigger they are the second smallest antelope that we see here so if you wanted to know how small they really are they're about the size of a small to medium dog that's about how big that is it's not very large at all and they are ones that move around in the thickets like this and it's one of the favorite animals for a leopard to hunt because they are in the same area so they both like thick dense vegetation and trees and grasses and those kind of things so they leopards come across them a lot and two they're the perfect size because a leopard can catch that and take it into a tree and feed off it over the course of a day or two and it makes a really good meal but it's not too big that they struggle to get it up into a tree so it's the perfect size animal for a especially a female leopard who's got a cub she can kill that and then she can drag it and put it up into a tree and then she can go and fetch her cub and bring her cub back to get some much needed food but you'll see that this little thing will be eating all the vegetation and they'll be very happy because we've had some rain over the last little bit and so and you'll find that they'll eat these little blades of grass and flowers and all of those kind of things that have come out in the last few days because of the rain that we've had falling. Now, I believe Byron was telling you all about bulls and cows in the bigger antelope. So this is one of the smaller antelope. So this is called a ram. So when they are small, they're called rams and ewes. So much like a sheep would be the same thing. And when they get bigger, when they're like a kudu or 
something that size, then it is a bull and a cow. So that's the difference between the, the male and female antelopes and between the small and big antelopes. Now you can see it's scratching its ear a little bit. There's lots of flies around. So the flies will irritate it and cause it a little bit of drama and trauma and so that's why you'll have a situation where they scratch like that and the ears will be constantly be twitching not only because of the flies but because these animals are generally very shy they don't like to be seen and they don't like to be disturbed and anything that moves normally sets them off running trying to get away from it and the name diker which is what i was saying to you earlier is actually an afrikaans word so afrikaans is a language spoken here in south africa very similar to dutch and afrikaans in a diker means a diver and so it refers to the way that that animal when it's trying to hide from you will run and it will dive towards thick bushes so that it can hide away so that you can't see it so it's a very clever name for it and they generally don't stay on the camera for very long so you got very lucky to see that antelope for as long as we did good let's carry on let's see what else we can find and see if i can find the spotty leopard for you before we sort of leave you guys and before you have to go off to your next class so let's try and see what we can find but while we do that let's send you back across to the big bull elephants and byron uh, the elephants moved away from us a little bit but i'm going to get closer to them shortly so just stick with us um, and i see some other animals close to the elephant too some wildebeest so it would be wonderful to show them all to you Louis, I don't know exactly how far an elephant can hear. I think it's difficult to be accurate. Um, I'll tell you why I say that is if the wind blows, say for example the elephant is downwind of us, so the wind is blowing from us to the elephant, he would hear us a lot easier. If the elephant was upwind from us, he probably wouldn't hear us at well, as, as well. I would say they can hear... Uh, Maybe, I mean, if an elephant uh, trumpets or something, they can hear that up to a mile or two miles away easily. Um, elephants are very, very loud and they can hear that far. But um, if we were sneaking up on them, they probably wouldn't hear us until we got uh, very, very close, if we were quiet though. You can see all these piles of dung on the road. And um, I don't know if, uh, if you saw them, but that's all elephant dung and I can actually smell it. Very, very strong elephant smell. Uh, sorry, Rebecca, what was Lily's question? Ah, Lily, an elephant can live very long uh, or up to a very long old age. An elephant probably can live up to about 50 or 60 years in the wild. I'm getting closer, but uh, ah, there we go. Have a look in front of us. All these wildebeest on the clearings. So it's a lovely area, nice and open. There's a lot of grass for these wildebeest to feed on. Now, where have the elephant gone? Okay, wait, we've got a wonderful spot here because just off to my left, we can see the elephant again, one of the elephants we saw. There were three earlier. And still enjoying the marula fruit. But yes, Lily, 50 or 60 years old for the elephant. I have a look at the wildebeest walking past us. Nathaniel, the tusks can get very, very large, up to one and a half, or I think there have been records of two meter tusks um, for very, very large elephant bulls, and they can weigh a number of, uh, or, or many, many kilograms, they're very, very heavy. Now, if they break off, which they do do from time to time, um, they are collected and they are, are um, put in, um, in vaults to to save them because an elephant tusk is actually very valuable the ivory so they are they are locked away if they find massive tusks that have broken off an elephant
Mariah, those tusks do grow out of the mouth. They actually, a, I think the best way I can describe it for you is a modified tooth. So it is technically teeth of the elephant, but they are slightly modified and they've got a few extra um, proteins and nutrients in the tusks to make them stronger. But, um, but they, are, they are coated in an enamel, so similar to teeth, but they are stronger than regular teeth. And it's that ivory that we spoke about, but it is actually a tooth. Uh, I'm not sure where they... Um, I wanted to show you yeah, the wildebeest again. And Tommy, you were asking about the, the rainy season. Now you can see these wildebeest all enjoying that very green grass at the moment. And it's because it is our rainy season at the moment. So it's not monsoon rain, Tommy. It doesn't rain every, every day. However, um, with the rains, it's our summer rainfall. So we get our, our rain in summer. And our summer is different to yours in the United States. It is from about November, December, January, February. That's the, the height of our summer, and that's when we get the most rain. And you can see the bush is very, very green and beautiful at the moment, and it's good for all these animals. A lot of food for them to feed on. And speaking about food... I promise to show you what the marula fruit looked like for those of you who haven't seen it yet. And I just want to show you quickly. This is all marula fruit that the elephants are feeding on. Look at that. Not very, very big. This is a really big one. That's a big marula fruit. These are not ripe yet. The, when they are ripe, they turn a yellowish color. This is still quite green. but They turn a yellowish color. And we can eat them too. Very rich in vitamin C. Very tasty. You've got to peel the skin off. I'm not going to do it now because these are very, very sour. But you peel the skin off and then it's got a bit of fruit but a very large seed inside. Very large pip. And you can eat the fruit and throw the skin away. Nice and juicy. Wonderful to eat if you are in the bush. Just remember, don't eat anything in the bush unless somebody has told you exactly what it is and that it is safe to eat because we do have some poisonous fruit and plants out here. Okay, I'm going to see where those elephants have gone. I think they've moved off, but Tristan has got a beautiful antelope he wants to show you. I do indeed. I've got one of my kind of favorite antelopes, in fact, two of them. So you can see there's the one in front of it. has got a big white ring on its bottom that is very furry and looks much like your animals that you see up in the United States, like the elk or some of those that are quite fluffy. It's quite uncommon for our antelope because our antelope here, generally because of how hot it is, can't have thick fur. But these guys are interesting because they spend a lot of time near water and they use water to get away from lion and leopard and, and wild dogs and so they need longer fur for two reasons. One is because the longer fur helps to keep them warm. Generally where you are near water it's very low lying and what that means is that when the air gets cold, cold air sinks and that means it's much colder near water than it is away from water. So that just helps to insulate them and keep them nice and warm. The second thing is that these guys secrete an oil out of glands in their skin. So much like we sweat, they secrete an oil and that oil basically repels water. So what that means is it pushes water away and so the oil covers all of that hair and the more hair they've got, the more they can push water away and the drier they can stay. So it's a very clever system that they've got in order to try and keep themselves nice and dry that if they run through water or or they're in areas where there's lots of water that they can keep nice and clean and dry and not get too wet. Now the antelope in the background is called an impala and impalas are the most common antelope that we see here in South Africa or in this part of South Africa. They are everywhere and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them and they are probably the biggest food item for all of our predators. So you'll find that everything from snakes all the way up to the lions, even some of the eagles will go after impalas which is quite amazing because they are not the smallest antelope that we have they're not as small as the daiko but yet everything will try and hunt them and so they hang around in big groups to try and stop the predators from getting too close because the more they are in a big group the more they can spot and they can smell and they can hear and keep all of those predators away so it's very clever to be in big groups like this 
So, Elliot, you, you are asking whether or not dakers are as fast as leopards. Well, they are, and if not faster, because they have to be as fast as a leopard, otherwise they would just get caught all the time. So they are very, very fast. The thing is, though, is a leopard, the way the leopard catches them is by trying to get into a place where it can stalk the diker and it can get very very close and then it uses surprise to jump out and grab it before it's able to run away but the diker can definitely run just as fast as the leopard can now in the background there you'll see that there is a stripy animal also hidden behind the trees there are some zebra here so it's two male zebras that are in this area I know that they're both boys because I saw them this morning and they have been spending a bit of time down in this area area and moving around so those the zebra are probably young males that have been kicked out of their herd and are trying to move around and find an area of their own they're not old enough yet to establish themselves or to be dominant so to be a dad and so they have to walk around and kind of find a good place to feed now bishop you're wondering if animals are born with stripes or how they get them or when do they get them well any of these animals that you see out here they are born with these markings so if we go to can you come to this water buck for me Fergus so there's a water buck that's right in front of me over there that one now that water buck has got a little baby somewhere there I don't know where the little baby's gone now I did see it maybe it's lying down somewhere in that area and that little baby there it is just to the left of the mom so just come to the left Ferg a little bit more a little bit more there it is you see its face sitting in the grass there so it's just sitting in the bush now that little baby has just been born in the last few probably last few days and it has the same markings and same stripes and patterns that the adult has and so even when they're born they will have the same markings it's just smaller but you see how well that one camouflages or hides away absolutely amazing and the reason why they sit like that is so that predators don't spot them and they're able to stay much safer it's very clever for an antelope to be like that what you'll also notice is that it's slightly lighter in color than the parent because it's able to hide away in the grass and if it was dark it would be able to be seen a lot easier good we're going to sit with all of these animals and appreciate them as they feed along but while we do that let's send you across to Ali who's found one of the most beautiful birds of prey that we get here We do, and it is looking <laughs> with a very messy feather head almost. This beautiful bird that we're looking at, it's called a batelier. Now, it's one of the first eagles that will detect food if there's anything that's died around a specific area, as they, they can hunt, but they also come and scavenge from other predators. But the fact that we're seeing it up here in a tree, it doesn't really, or doesn't necessarily mean that there's something around here that it might want to eat. I think it's also just trying to, um, Oh, dry up a little bit because we've had pretty much almost 14 hours straight of just rain and rain and rain and it stopped this morning and I think all of the birds and all of the creatures are just enjoying the fact that they can stand on a tree let the breeze hit them and then dry up a little bit because you can imagine that they were quite cold this morning when all that rain was pouring down on us it's a beautiful bird and you can see the wind is blowing <laughs> and all its feathers are going the wrong way. It's one of my favorite birds around in this particular area and it's also known as the short-tailed eagle. Now it's called as a short-tailed eagle because compared to other eagles it's got a much shorter tail. Memphis you're wondering how much this eagle eats in a day. Well um, it depends. It Most animals can eat about maybe 5% of the, their body weight if we're getting very technical. So for this guy, I would assume anywhere around 2 to maybe 4 kilograms of meat if it, if it gets very, very lucky in one day to eat all that much. But they'll often, what you'll see that most of the eagles will do is that they'll eat something small and then they'll eat something small. So they eat many meals a day. And not always do they get full only when they find something bigger but the trick for them is just to carry on trying to find as much food as they can so they in particular they're very well known for hunting or for eating everything that is found on the roads especially the snakes right it's been a pleasure having you guys on board and i hope you've enjoyed all the sightings
and all of the different things that we've been able to show you guys today from the eagle to the elephants to the marula trees and the baby lambs and on my behalf and of Tristan and Byron and everyone on FC we'll see you guys the next time <laughs> seems like Byron has been able to found a sun sounder of piglets so let's head over to him and find out what they're up to Uh, well, the schools have just left us, and don't forget to send us your questions, hashtag Safari Live uh, via Twitter for the rest of you who are continuing with us. Have a look, this beautiful warthog, one of my favorite animals, and um, I think they're one of my friend's favorites too, and I think he's watching at the moment, Mark and his wife Sharice, they're in South Africa, but they still watch very often and uh, they enjoy the bush just as much as I do so Mark's trying to learn a little bit about the bush uh, Marky I hope you're learning there's gonna be a test after this let's see if I can see these uh, these little warthogs again it's a female with two piglets um, and they s there we go there's another quick view I think we'll have of the female with the two piglets look at that they I really enjoy the warthog. They've got such character. You see those tails raise immediately as those youngsters run. The tail stiffens and they raise them up. They're going to disappear through that thicket shortly. Nice little view, quick view of, of the warthogs. Wonderful to see them. And they were lying down when we did find them. I think these warthogs are enjoying the, this rain that we've had because there's been a lot of mud. And the warthog do enjoy wallowing in the mud, covering their skin. It protects their skin from ticks, keeps them cool. So I'm sure they enjoyed all the rain that we've had. Now, speaking of animals that enjoy water, Tristan has got some more water buck. Well, we are still with our water buck. This is another little baby that came across the dam wall. Our other one that was hidden in the grass is probably is just stood up, but these two came from the other side. And so lots of baby water buck all over the place. There's an Egyptian goose in the foreground, which gives you an indication of just how little these baby water buck are when they are born. They are not very big at all. You can see them kind of waddling along and making their way across the dam wall. Now we are on Chitwe at the moment, so the reason why we're here is for hopefully to see what's happening within Suku and Tingana. I'm sure some of you by now will have heard the news that Kuchava was seen this morning with her first cub that she's ever had, a brand new little ball of fluff that is just one of them apparently and a very very shy little um, cub that was trying to run away from the vehicles and apparently Kuchava was a little stressed about it as well so they've closed that sighting, it is a negative sighting, we cannot go anywhere near that so we'll try and stay away from that, it was on Chitwa driveway and so it is on Chitwa, which is fantastic news for us going forward. Hopefully we will get to see a glimpse of that little one at some stage soon. Now, talking about little ones, our other little water buck has stood up and is now having a little drink by the looks of things. I wonder if it's going to have a bit of milk from the mom. There we go. How cute is that? It can only be a few days old. It's really not very big at all. It is super cute. There's something about little baby waterbuck. I don't know why. Maybe it's because they're a lot fluffier than others. But they really are the cutest of the antelope babies, in my opinion. I always think that they are kind of far too fluffy for their own good. And they kind of bump, bounce around all over the place. And I think they're absolutely the cutest little things out here. And so it's always nice when you find them. And like I say, this must be only a matter of a few days old. So I definitely would go to fish because your Twitter handle is to fish or not to fish, but I would go to fish definitely. And <laughs> to fish or not to fish is asking about the elant and why we don't see many here. Uh, simply because terrain is not good for them. Um, elant are also dry 
area animal they prefer drier habitats than what we've got here um, and so also the amount of predators it's just not a great place for them they prefer more long grass areas so the Mara does well for them because the grass gets very long um, you also find them in the northern parts of Kruger where you can get long grass areas interestingly enough though I just spent some time in northern Kruger and, and elants normally are an animal that are quite tough to find in the Kruger Park you don't see them that often and those of you that have visited the Kruger Park and are from South Africa or have just come out to South Africa will know that you don't see them often at all but I went on a recent trip and I actually saw I think it was five or six different sightings of elant while I was there in nice big groups with lots of babies so it seems as though their numbers are doing quite well and they're actually increasing in number rather than de decreasing and I wonder if it's got anything to do with the fact that we've gone into a very dry period so we've had a bit of a drought which means that hopefully these animals are, you know elant, sable, roan who thrive in drier periods have gotten better now I believe somebody is calling me just hold on two seconds you go ahead copy that will do thank you no problem right so it was just somebody that was getting hold of me about the male lion and male leopard but anyway we were talking about elant and and so it seems as though their numbers have done well also they've shut off a number of water holes in the Kruger which has meant that things like zebra and wildebeest impala um, warthogs have all shifted away from those areas a little bit and therefore the grass is starting to grow a little bit longer and and, and creates a good habitat for sable roe and elant to have their little ones and to keep them hidden and so I wonder if that's maybe why their numbers are looking better than what they were previously it's interesting to see kind of how it's going oh hello little one are you looking up into the tree they are very cute these little babies when they're this size I think they're very very cool if you don't find that cute then there's and I don't know then you might need to go and just get your head examined by somebody that has a degree in those things because if you don't, like I say if you don't like a little baby animal that's fluffy like that then there's something wrong in this world anyway it's just disappearing off with mom now it's starting to meander along and it's such a nice scene here at Chitwe we're down at Chitwe Dav at the moment as one would maybe imagine but you've got warthogs, zebra, waterbuck, impalas so lots of amazing animals all together it's such a wonderful place to spend time and so while we kind of just enjoy all of these animals and enjoy the kind of complexities of all the ant the antelope mixing together let's send you across to Byron with a blackbird that is hiding I believe now this is a wonderful sighting it's a cuckoo I'm just having a look it's a it, it's a juvenile but I can't see if those are striped. I think they are. It's a juvenile uh, um, levalent cuckoo. And I'll show you quickly uh, the levalent uh, stripes. It used to be known as the striped cuckoo. But uh, I think this is a juvenile levalent. Uh, just trying to see because it's a bit difficult. It's jumping around there. Uh, there it's actually on the tree now. Hold on, let me go forward. We might get a better view straight through there. VM, have you got him there? Oh, just behind there, all done. Let's see if we can see any striping, uh, or streaking rather. See, it looks a little mottled, it's still young. Now the Jacobin cuckoo looks very similar, but it's completely white. I think this is a young, uh, a young levalence. I'm just quickly going to find Jacobin for us. Uh, I'd like to show you the difference. Um, see, the, yeah. It's tough. It's very tough. But that's. A, I think this is a young striped. And I'll tell you it, um, why. Or another way we can find out is. Uh, Sure, this is tough, 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 tough. It's on the ground there. Let's just see. It's difficult to get a good view of it. I'm going to try to use my binoculars. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It's, but it is a young one. Usually they fly. Look, there's a beautiful view of it. Would you say there's a start, a start of streaking on the throat? Or is it just 
dirt. <laughs> but it is a youngster, it is a juvenile. Um, just the behavior, it hasn't flown yet. I don't see much streak here, I wonder if it's not a Jacobin. Um, if any of you have ideas, but do you see what I'm looking for? So the, the black and white markings uh, on the levalence, and they've got streaking, but it's not very prominent in that one yet. Um, and on the Jacobin, it's got no streaking at all. But the tricky thing is, is the back of the bird all, all looks very, very similar. They've both got black on their head. And down the wings, they've both got white little squares or markings on the wings. Uh, There's a nice view of it again. See that little white square on the wing? Now both Jacobin and Levalence have that. Now if it would call, it might make it a bit easier for us. The call is slightly different. But I do think this is a young Levalence. I don't think it's a Jacobin. Unfortunately, my bird app doesn't have uh, doesn't have a picture of a juvenile. I can hear another one calling. Let's play. I'm just going to play the call here for you quickly. Yeah, this is the this is the levalence. There's another one calling in the distance, and um, and I think it's the same one. It's probably unlikely to find the other one around also you know what we don't see we don't see many many jacobin cuckoo here we, we we have seen before but you don't see as many we do see a lot more levalence so on that theory i'm going to say that it is a young levalence it is a young levalence but nice to see them because we thought most of the cuckoos have disappeared most of them have but there's still one or two around they haven't migrated yet uh, I'm not sure who we're linking to so Rebecca I didn't hear let's go across to either Ali or Tristan Well, Byron, it's not surprising when birds are around, Byron switches off, both the feathered kind and otherwise. But anyway, we are sitting still with our little baby waterbuck and just waiting for our time to start heading towards Tingana and see what he's doing up on that side. Now, Gordon, the number of species of antelope that we get in I wonder if you're asking in the world or you're asking in South Africa or in the Kruger Park system, the Sabi Sand system. If we're talking in the world, I have absolutely no idea how many, but in Juma here in, in this part of the world, I'll have to think about it now. In terms of antelope, we'd have, let's count them. We've got Steenbok, Daika, then we have Impalas, Bushbuck, Nyala, Kudu, Waterbuck. What am I forgetting? That's it, eh? Just the seven of them. I think it's just the seven of them. There has been reports of sable in the Sabi Sands, so I suppose we can throw in a sable in there. And in fact, an elant has also been seen in the Sabi Sands once before. So potentially nine different antelope. I think I don't think I'm missing any of them. If we're talking ungulates or hoofed animals, well then obviously it grows out a little bit because you'll have to add zebras and giraffe and wildebeest and buffalo and those kind of things. But in terms of the actual proper antelope species, there will be a potential nine that you could see. But here on Juma commonly seen is just the seven of them i'm sure i'm missing one but maybe not i don't know i'll count it in my brain but i think that's all of them i don't think we have any others that i'm missing right now i believe we can start making our way towards tingana so let's do that we're going to leave our little baby waterbuck be careful little waterbuck when tingana and hosano are around it is not safe at all we know tingana loves a little baby waterbuck or he used to anyway i'm pretty sure he's going to be on the prowl at some point and if he managed to kill that impala which it sounds like he did then he might be coming back to find a fettle and that might mean trouble for not only these waterbuck but maybe even for hukumuri as well because i'm sure tingana once he feels fit again is going to be on the prowl but in saying that i also have a theory that this kill that was made by um 10 species of antelope in juma byron sorry i've got to update that byron says there are 10 
I'm interested to know what 10 he's talking about, but while I kind of think about it, let's send you across to him so you can list them all and we'll see who's right. Uh, okay, well, Tristan, I... Okay, so here, here are my antelope species, not my antelope species, the antelope species I think we find here. Okay, let's start with the smallest quickly. So we've got, uh, we see Steenbok, Daker, then Impala, Bushbuck, uh, Inyala, Kudu, Waterbuck, Wildebeest, and we have seen a sable on the dam cam last year a sable was seen in the area on juma now this is just on juma itself uh i don't know if an eland has been seen in the area but then the eland would be 10 or the other one that could be 10 is the reedbuck which we've seen on uh, on cheetah plains so that would be 10. um so nine definite on juma and that maybe little one on uh, cheetah plains there we go, Tristan. So, quite a few species in this area. Oh, now Tristan is trying to get technical and saying the wildebeest is an ungulate, but not really a strict antelope. It's part of the antelope family. Um, well, you can't get out of that one, Tristan. Okay, well then, eight, if you want to be very technical. Eight or nine, let's call it nine, because then I will count the uh, uh, the reedback that we see on Cheetah Plains. Then it's nine if you want to leave the poor wildebeest out. Yeah, I agree, I agree. That's not very nice. Um, VM, VM, the wildebeest behind me says the wildebeest should be included. <laughs> oh, I'm scared. <laughs> I am scanning the trees for some more interesting birds. Ali said she had tracks of buffalo earlier um, heading in this direction. I've been looking. I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, perhaps, perhaps around the other way, which we will be going shortly. Also checking these drainage lines very carefully. Any little sign. I'm looking for interesting things this afternoon. Uh, well, look, it's always interesting, but but smaller creatures, birds, interesting birds, little animals, insects that might be hiding. Uh, Veer might be upset because I know he wants to see a leopard. Veer, we saw a leopard yesterday in the rain. <laughs> but he says we haven't seen one today. Um, uh, Veer, all right, we'll try. We'll try our best. We'll try our best. I'm really enjoying this cool weather at the moment after the rain. It's still very overcast. I wonder if we're going to get more rain. But that storm last night really was wonderful. It rained really hard this morning too, just before we woke up. Louise, are you asking what classifies something as an antelope? So, uh, Eloise, if I'm not, not mistaken, let's go through it quickly. But uh, an antelope is an ungulate uh, herbivore with um, uh, that's got, uh, and you get odd toed and even toed ungulates. Uh, an antelope is an even toed ungulate, split hoof. Uh, also the horn structure, so the horns that grow throughout their lifespan. Um, they are ruminants, so they've got a, a four-chambered stomach. Um, so not four stomachs, but a four-chambered stomach. Um, that helps feed for feeding. I'm just trying to see if there's perhaps any other description that I can quickly find here for you with antelope. Um, in this book... Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, sorry. No, it doesn't really give a description in this book of uh, 
of antelope. Sorry, I'm just looking at this mammal book if it's anything. But um, they start with buffalo and antelope. So buffalo, they've classed them together. Now that's going back up in taxonomy. So a little bit, or oh, a few, uh, let's call it um, layers back or a few classes back. So as you know, it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Seven um, categories of taxonomy. It's all that gets very comp complicated and you've got these huge scientific words. We did enough scientific words this morning, I think, with um, with all the animals. But um, buffalo and antelope, well, they're herbivores. They are ruminants. So that's why they're classified to kind of together, closer together than some of the other animals. But um, then antelope would split off slightly. Um, we can ask Tristan too if he knows of any other uh, classifications of antelope and what makes uh, antelope an antelope. I just want to see quickly if a blue wild beast, a wildebeest, is in the antelope category. I'm just paging through here quickly. Heart beast. Yeah. Oh. It is indeed. There's Bontobok, uh, the Tessabi, and then Wildebeest. So the mammal book clearly classifies the Wildebeest as an antelope. Tristan, I'm counting it. Then straight after the Wildebeest is the Impala. So definitely, definitely an antelope. <laughs> Gordon, antelope are not related to American deer um, in terms of, uh, well, there may be a, 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 quite a few similarities, hoof structure, stomach digestive system. Um, however, the deer, the main difference between deer and antelope, and some of you may have heard this many times before, the, the difference is that deer grow antlers. The males, the they grow antlers, they grow through, um, basically, sorry, they grow for a year and then they shed annually. However, the antelope, their horns grow throughout their lifetime and if they break, they do not grow back. So an antelope's horns will grow constantly, whereas the deer shed their antlers annually. So that is the main difference. So not really, I mean, they're probably very close in terms of, uh, of of taxonomy and naming and and structure of the animals, but um, but then they do split and they are different. Closer, further down, when you get probably family, um, yeah, family, genus, species that would all be all be very different. Well, it's nice and peaceful, and I think Viam and I are going to enjoy the peace and quiet for a while. Let's go across to Ali and see how little bumble around Juma is going. Oh, right. Seems like Tandy will forever like to put me on a run around to see any of her offspring. So I think I'm just <laughs> destined to work really hard for a glimpse of any of her cubs because Tamba was pretty much the same. Now, we've driven the area roughly where Byron had her yesterday, but we have had no luck with alarm calls, tracks, no indication as if she was anywhere around here or not. So I think this is pretty much the last two track that I want to check just in case she is anywhere around here because it would be a spectacular spot for her to be in. It's very guarded, lots of water, potentially even food for her to hunt. But so far, no luck whatsoever. I feel like this is a deja vu. Peter, in relation to the cub of, or the father of Kuchawa's cub, I would put, I would assume, just judging by who she was mating with, that there's a chance that it's either quarantine or Tingana's um, offspring. Now, I would say quarantine because Kuchawa tends to hang around a little bit further east than what she does um, 
or from this particular area where we're in. And I know Tingana was seen mating with her. I'm not too sure if there's any photographic proof of Kuchava mating with quarantine, although I... Th I think I remember something along those lines, but I think that would be one of the two options. Now, hopefully we'll be able to have a glimpse of that little one as well at some point. That would be fairly magical, but I um, wouldn't be angry if I managed to see her. What, what would she be? The cousin? It's almost like Tingana and Tamba and Tingana and uh, Hosanna and Tamba relationship. It's half-brother, yet uncle, yet cousin, <laughs> and that, all that kind of relationship. Now, not even one squirrel alarm calling. So I would imagine that it's very void of leopard, this particular area. Seems like Tristan is also confused. The leopards are confusing us. The cats are confusing us. So let's go to Tristan and find out why he's confused too. I have no idea why they're confused. This doesn't look like a very confused cat at all. It looks like a rather sleepy cat that knows exactly what it's up to. But as you can see, Nsuku is absolutely passed out. He is on the runway of Chitwe, taking it very easy and is having a good snooze, as is Tingana, who has positioned himself quite elegantly in the bowels of a marula at the other side of the airstrip over there. So there's Tingana having a nice little sleep. He looks perfectly happy in the tree, got his legs draped over, and so neither one seems to be worrying about the other one at the moment. I feel like everything is going to be fairly quiet until this evening, and then there should be a lot more going on later in the day. I think for now, Tingana knows being up in the tree is definitely a better option than being down on the ground, and so he's just going to sleep it out and wait to see what goes on. Now, I have no idea where the carcass is in relation to where either one of these animals are. Ali was here this morning, so she will have a better idea of where the carcass was, or if there is even a carcass that's left. And maybe this male lion came up and ate it, and he's just kind of sitting around, lounging and waiting for Tingana to move. I don't know, but we'll, we'll investigate just now. We only just got here, and so we have plenty of time to have a little look around, although I think this might be a very busy sighting indeed, given the amount of radio chatter there is about it at the moment. And Suku, though, very sleepy, which is not what, well, I wouldn't have expected anything less from a male lion at this time of the day. I would have imagined that they would have been very sleepy and kind of taking it quite easy. I didn't think Insuku would be too busy, especially given that he was roaring late into the morning. I think he's made his statement and now he's just going to take it nice and easy and really kind of just enjoy the cool sand that is on the airstrip. But how incredible is that to see not only a leopard but a male lion in the same place? Not every day that that happens and, and certainly a very, very special thing i don't know what it is about this airstrip there is something about tingana and the birmingham boys and the chitwa airstrip that they all seem to get themselves into this tangle and this kind of dance off that happens we all now all we need is just tamba and hosana to arrive and that will sort of complete the picture that we had the last time we had the birminghams and the leopards all together which is you know a few months ago when they were kind of all feeding or three leopards were feeding off the kill while i think it was in fumu that day i can't even remember actually maybe it wasn't it was watching from afar so lots happens on this airstrip and it's it's obviously a good place for hunting because of the number of leopards that or number of prey animals that hang around here it's been always been a great place for hunting They've had many different leopards on kills in this particular area so it's not surprising at all that Tingana maybe had this. But I have a theory, which I was talking about just now before Byron started to go on about 10 antelope species that he couldn't even name. But at, I have a theory that maybe this might have been even been Kuchava's kill. Maybe that's why she went and fetched the cub and why she was out and about and that she was actually seen is because potentially she made this kill and Tingana heard it and maybe stole it. I, that's very possible because she was seen not far from here heading in this direction and all of a sudden then changed direction and went an opposite way. So I wonder if maybe she didn't kill this, went to go fetch the cub, maybe to introduce that cub to the, for the first time to meet. I don't know, but it would be a sensible option to think about. Whether or not it's true, I have no idea. And like I say, Tingana could have caught this on his own accord, but you never know with Tingana. He's always been good at robbing kills from others, as have the Birminghams. Now I'm going to reposition a little bit, just so you guys can see more than just the back of a head and some legs dangling from a tree. I'm going to put you in front of Insuku for a little bit, just so you can kind of see his face and see the beauty that he is. He's one of the more sort of pretty of the Birmingham coalition. I think he 
is one of the better looking fellas. Him and Nena are the two good looking fellas out of this coalition, in my opinion. So, Lauren, you're wondering about runways. What happens? Do we use the runways? Are the runways used when lions are on them? So, normally what would happen is that a sound of an aeroplane buzzing overhead is enough normally to get a lion to get up and move off it. But if they do not get up and do not move, what they can do is they can shift some of the planes to land at other runways. So we do have elephant planes and Arethusa in this area that can be accessed by all of the lodges. Um, so they can just shift a plane that way if it's something big. But generally what they'll do is just drive the cars here and, and kind of just try and edge the lines off. It's for their safety, it's for the people that are landing safety and and, and that's what they normally try and do. You'll find though that it's, you know, this male lion wasn't actually lying on this runway all day today. During the, the hotter parts of the day, he was under the tree apparently. He just got up from under the tree and walked over here and flopped down again. So he hasn't been lying on the runway all day, but generally he would get kind of pushed off the runway by a vehicle just to make sure that he's out of the way and doesn't come running onto the, the runway as a plane would land. Actually on this runway, I've had an interesting experience where the Styx Pride pulled down a giraffe mid runway just on the top of this and they had it over the whole of the the runway it was literally lying over the whole thing and so for the first kind of day or two we we let it slide and we just diverted planes but it got a bit ridiculous because we had rain and arethusa airstrip at that stage was not a paved or tarred airstrip and so we couldn't land planes there elephant planes was closed and so all the planes couldn't land and the only place that they could land was chitwa because chitwa drains very well and so what we had to do is we actually had to get a tractor and we we had to kind of push the lines off a little bit and then we had to move their giraffe carcass which wasn't so much fun tying a rope to a rotten giraffe while a pride of lions looks at you and then we had to drag it off onto the open area and that allowed some of the planes to get in so that all the guests could get into this area because obviously you know it's a, a massive expense that some of the guests go through to book their flights into this place and it's not easy to just change that in a day's notice you can't just get another flight or another transfer in and so it had to be done unfortunately it wasn't exactly the ideal thing but we had to do it but it was amazing just to see that they didn't actually care because once we dragged it off they just sauntered on over and sat back next to the carcass as though nothing had really happened which is pretty cool anyway we're going to try probably reposition a little bit see if we can get into a place where we can see tingana while in Suku sleeps and so while we do that let's send you off to Byron who I think is looking at a bird that might want to feed off some blood as much as in Suku does. Uh, well there are birds here they are the oxpeckers you can just see them sitting on the beautiful kudu some three or three female kudu kudu cows and I'm moving through the thicket and they have a few oxpeckers on them, the red-billed oxpeckers. And always nice to see the kudu walking through through the bush. I'm sure Tristan is very happy with that sighting with that male lion and the leopard. And it's not something you see every day. And they've been in that area all day. The poor leopard Tingana up in the tree. I think he's not He's probably not too phased that he has to wait up there, but eventually that male will probably the male lion will probably move off. I think these could do have such beautiful faces, especially when they pin their ears back like that. Did you see that? And then they go off into the thicket to continue browsing on the foliage around here. Also stopped. Um, somebody said they thought they heard lions. Now I'm heading into an area where Ali is also kind of moving towards. So we're going to try and give each other a hand, I think, and see if we can find any fresh tracks of the Unkuhuma Pride. Um, excuse me, I think I just heard somebody call that... Uh, Sorry, I'm just uh, I'm just listening. Sorry, I'm listening to the radio. Some guides are calling in this um, this these lions and trying to track and find the lions. I hear Ali on the radio already. Uh, 
Um, give me a second, I'm just listening. So these lions, okay, so it sounds like the lions are on Torchwood at the moment, and um, but they are heading directly towards us. And I think Ellie is closer to that area than what I am. So hopefully she's going to be patient, waiting around there, and those lines will come through, and hopefully we can see the Unkuhuma Pride. Um, so we'll keep you updated and hopefully get a view of them shortly. But in the meantime, we still have that wonderful sighting of that male lion and male leopard with Tristan. We do indeed have our male lion and male leopard. Well, Suku is still fast asleep. I was about to go towards Tingani and he opened his eyes. And then, of course, as you come to us, he closes them again. Hopefully, he's going to give a little eye opening glance at us shortly because Fergus is framed beautifully for those golden eyes of Insuku to just pierce towards us. They slowly opening. Are they going to open? Insuku, come on. No he's decided i'm out so like i say he's still very very sleepy indeed i don't think he's going to have a situation where he's going to wake up for too much this afternoon no all right i think let's go towards tingana quickly while insuku sleeps like that tingana is not far away and so we'll try and see looks like a, maybe a bit of rain on the horizon in the north as well we're quite lucky because we're right down in the south so it looks nice and clear for us but the northern side looks like there is some rain at the moment so that's going to be a little on the tough side for whoever is in the north now i see tingana standing up which is interesting let's see if he's gonna move or what he's going to do there we go. We'll just stop here. Ah, he's in the tree with the kill. So Tingana's managed to get into the same tree as the kill, which is amazing. Now, Tula Ann, who's five years old, lions can get sand in their eye if they're not careful. If they rub their head a little bit, they can. But you'll find that their eyes are very sensitive. And so when sand goes towards the eye, they just close it very, very quickly. And they'll make sure that the sand doesn't come in and make sure that the eye stays nice and clean also they'll blink a lot and there'll be a secretion so a little bit of liquid that will try and kind of wash the eye and get rid of any particles of sand if they go towards the, or go into the eye and that keeps the eye nice and clean so sometimes you see their eyes have a little bit of leaking and that's where it is so tingana is in the tree with the kill which how he got in here i'm not quite sure but there we go you see there's the kill there and so it means that that male lion hasn't been able to get up there just yet and i wonder if tingana makes his way to towards that kill and goes into that area if maybe Insuku might wake up and actually try and move back towards the side it will be interesting to see how it goes it's going to be a kind of standoff I think between the two of them but Tingana doesn't look all that bad I, I mean I've you know I've seen many a, a leopard that's looked horrible and condition not good and when we saw Mvula the other day he really didn't look good but I mean Tingana is not as bulky as he could be but he's not exactly out of it for sure i mean he's still fairly decent condition he's got a bit of a you know skinny back leg area but that comes back quickly and if he's got himself a meal like this and he's managed to kind of hoist it and he can feed off it for the rest of the day he's going to be okay i think i think he'll kind of come right i mean obviously we don't know what's going on inside but he certainly hasn't lost that much condition that i would write him off i think he's still in good enough condition to kind of keep going for quite some time still let's see though i mean it's going to be interesting he's a bit obscured by a lot of branches so i'm hoping he's going to come across and maybe just get towards that carcass and see what happens now i would love to hear from all of you guys what you think of tingana does he look better than when ali saw him the other day and you can do that on hashtag safari live also if you've got any questions about what happens when male leopards and male lions meet now you can see tingana's lay back down again i think he's realized that he can't move just yet if he does move and start crunching on those bones so we're going to have a situation that Suku is going to hear it and then probably come and cause a bit of drama so it's a situation where I think he's going to lie down for now. I want to reposition Fergus because I think we can get a better view from the other side and see if we can just maybe see a little nicer than what we're seeing at the moment. Given that he's facing the other way, I'm sure he's going to move his head about and as leopards do, but it'll be, I think, a little better just to see in underneath than it is going to be from where we were. So Fergus is doing a very hearty spin around as we drive the tree. 
underneath the tree. Well done, Fergus. Very, very fancy. A lion would probably be able to get all the way to pretty much is at the moment. I'm just going to quickly reposition Ferg a little bit better just in case Insuku wants to put up his head then we can at least see him through the bush. And should be able to and should be able to kind of go all the way to the sort of top of those trees. As long as there's a fairly thick branch, he should be able to manage to do it. Um, in this case, I think even where Tingan is lying, he would be in potential danger. Now, I apologize if there was some breakup while I was driving around. And unfortunately, we're right on the southern side of Chitwe Airstrip, which means that sometimes Jigger unfortunately loses a little bit of its connection. And so I do apologize about that. But. It's an interesting tree. I, I actually think that that impala carcass may be a little bit high for that lion, and maybe the lion just loses its nerve trying to get up to that point. It is quite high up, and it is a big marula, and so maybe this male is just a little nervous. He doesn't have the same tree climbing ability that maybe Tinio has got. We've seen Tinio going up and grabbing a carcass from quite high up from Tundi the other day, which was a lot easier, I think, than this. And maybe that's why. Insuku actually hasn't gone up there just yet and, and Tingan has put it in a place where it's going to be quite difficult for that male to get to it and even if he tries to drag it a little bit further up I think you know he's probably fairly safe where he is now it'll be interesting to see I mean we're going to try and stick around for as long as we can it is going to be a busy sighting so it will be interesting Mac, no. So Tingana will not move a carcass to another tree. And, and the simple reason for that is that any movement he makes in this tree is going to attract the attention of that male lion. And coming down and trying to drag a carcass slows him right down. And it's just going to make him fodder for a attack by a lion. So it's better just to put it, keep it up in the tree for him to be up in the tree. And even if that lion climbs up, he'll go on to much smaller branches than what Insuku can be on. So he is able to balance much better. He'll be able to get onto branches that are much narrower that Insuku won't trust his weight on. And so Tingan is better off staying up in the tree, waiting for Insuku to leave, and also to just keep the carcass up there. If he came down and dragged that carcass, it's most certainly going to end up in either him being robbed or him even being robbed and killed at the same time. So he needs to be a bit careful of that and needs to stay away. The other good bit of news I've got is, other than the fact that Tingan is in the same tree as the carcass, is that I believe Hukamuri is nowhere near our area anymore. He's gone all the way back west towards Simbambili and is lying very close to Simbambili Dam, which is great news. It means that at least Tandi is all right for now. Hopefully the little cub is okay and, you know, she can rest a little bit easier for now. We know that he can move a long distance, but at least he didn't linger around the area where Tandi and cub was for too long. Right, Tingan is still resting, still relaxing, taking it very easy, so we'll sit and enjoy that. And while we do, let's send you back across to Ali and see what's happening with those Inkumas and where they are. Right, well, it seems like they are on Torchwood, or at least there's only one, and I'm just going to try and go a little bit forward, because there's only one lioness that's been spotted and it's actually inside of Torchwood so we are on the boundary waiting for her to come this way because she's been steadily walking along the road and we can hear her getting closer and closer so hopefully if we wait enough she'll is gonna come this way Ooh, I'm losing my earpiece here now I'm hoping that she's gonna carry on coming we had some alarm calls uh, roughly in the area where Tandi was yesterday for a squirrel but then the squirrel went quiet and we couldn't find anything so I wonder if perhaps there aren't any other lions around here. That would make also a little bit of sense. So we're just waiting for her to come. I think that if I stay quiet, <laughs> we might be able to hear it. Well, seems like she's gone quiet for now, but we're gonna stay around here, see if perhaps we can keep up with her and we'll keep you guys posted. In the meantime, Byron's got a very cool bird he'd like to show you. I do, but good luck, Ali. I hope you have some luck with those uh, lions, but we are watching a African harrier hawk. And it's interesting, it, it looks like it's trying to dig in that, in that uh, um, branch of the tree. It looks like an old dead branch that it's digging in. It's been pulling, pulling bits and pieces of bark off. Look at those sharp talons. Now I wonder what it's found in there. 
Now these birds are expert at, experts at raiding nests. Those long legs they hold on. Sometimes they even hang upside down and stick their long necks into into nests to get to chicks or eggs. Now this one's scratching and trying to get something. I wonder what it is. Oh, what is that? It's, it looked like it had something there. I wonder if it is in a snake. Let's see. I'm not sure, but it looked like it was something long and thin. Let's see if it pulls something out there. <laughs> Often the patients look. There's definitely something that it looks like it's it's pulling at something. What is that? I wonder. We just can't see. You know what, patience often pays off, so so let's wait and see. Maybe it pulls something out of that branch. These are one of my favorite birds. Ah, oh, scorpion! Look at that, it caught a scorpion. I just caught a glimpse. I hope all of you saw that. It's found a little scorpion, and I think it was picking at the tail, and it's eating the scorpion. That's amazing. Now, I would assume that is... A pistacanthus, look, you, there you could see it clearly. A pistacanthus, uh, a pistacanthus asper, I think is the tree creeping scorpion. And they live in the bark of trees like that. And that's what this African harrier hawk has caught and is feeding on. Now that's a good source of, of protein. And it probably, look there, you can see it clearly. Look at the tail or the sting. They, the whole thing, they just finished it. Occasionally what these birds might do, and I've seen it before, it will look like two scorpions there. Um, what these birds do is they might just bite the tail very quickly. I've seen it with, uh, there's an, is, oh no, that was just the talon. I'm just double checking if there's not another scorpion in there. Don't think so. I think it's finished now. But um, what these birds do, and I've seen it with meerkats too. They, When they dig a scorpion out, they quickly bite the tail. They just break the tail. And then that scorpion is unable to turn the tail around and sting whatever prey is trying to feed on it. And especially this African harrier hawk, I think that's exactly what it did. But that was such a wonderful, wonderful sighting. Something quite rare. And I said I was looking for something interesting this afternoon. That is a highlight for me, seeing an African harrier hawk dig out a scorpion. Now, it sounds like Ali has had some luck with the lions. Let's go and have a look. We have indeed, and just in time to watch her finally carry on making her way towards Juma. Now there is a termite mound not too far from where she is, so I'm hoping, crossing fingers, that she's going to go up there. Come on. Yes. Oh, yay. Perfect. Now you see she's contact calling, and she's unfortunate there's a car that's close to us, but I'm sure they're also going to switch off, and she's been calling for a little bit now and I'm sure she's looking for the rest of the pride here we go it's not the loudest call she can make oh you stunning cat thank you very much that is a very pretty place for you to lie in queen of the mound very leopard fashion of you I must say uh, I'm afraid of talking too much because she is making contact calls and it's an absolutely interesting sound so I would like for everyone to be able to hear it as well. Seems she's definitely looking for some more lions and not too far from here we had those lion trucks from the morning. There we go. Very faint. Now, I would assume that perhaps the rest of the pride is not too far and maybe they split up during the night while they're busy hunting. Could be a reason for it, why she's all alone, but she's definitely, there are more lions somewhere and that's what she's doing. She's trying to find out where they are just by making that soft call. It's gonna travel. She doesn't want to fully roar and give her position away, but she definitely wants to pick up where the rest of the lions are. There she is, she's roaring again. 
It's also part of the reason why she's gone on the mound. Can you guys hear that? Where's the rest of your pride? you're wondering what type of calls do lions make to communicate well they do they have a wide range the one that we're listening to now is called a contact call and you will hear it in between pride members or perhaps a mom with a cub and they it's, it's a soft call they're just trying to find out where the rest of the pride members are and they're trying to reunite calling each other it's almost like telling one another come to me now obviously there's a roaring which we heard um, this morning it tends to be more of a territorial call just to call to Oh, here we go again. To reinstate their territory and that they're in a particular area. It's a call that they make when they want the world to know that they are there. And then of course they make the snarling and growl noises when they're feeling threatened um, by either another lion, by another pride member, or when they're just annoyed with the cubs or pretty much any other pride member they just make that or you know humans even if we go on foot and we find them or any other creature it's more of an aggressive defensive standoff call this is also with the roaring one of my favorite sounds i find it's such an endearing sound it's like very intimate very private sound that lions only make for other lions reports of another lioness further south but I cannot hear anything from where we are and uh, if she can then she's definitely not that close to us going to be a while before you find the rest of your pride. Jane, you're wondering if we name the female lions. Um, there are some of them that have got certain characteristics that stand out and then makes it easier for us to identify. Perhaps in the Inkahuma Pride, we have amber eyes that has got those striking amber eyes. <laughs> and then she's easy to, to tell apart. But no, as far as I know, we don't have a specific name for every specific lioness. Just it seems that the ones that tend to stand out the most because of um, some sort of feature, then they almost get a nickname that refers directly to them. Either amber eyes, there's a lioness in the Southern Pride that's called Floppy Ear because she's got a floppy ear. And I think that's pretty much it. But we haven't assigned them or I don't think they have been given names. Like, for example, the Birmingham boys have been given. <laughs> I almost want to cry. <laughs> She's so sad. Where's the rest of your pride? Did you get greedy and go eat by yourself and you lost them? Now it does happen every now and again that they'll split up, especially if they're hunting or after the rains or perhaps if they were interested in, in one of the males. And I do remember a few days ago when Suku was particularly interested in one of the females and he was trailing her and, you know, just sniffing behind her back and so on. So I think there one of them was potentially going into heat. I cannot recall which one it was exactly, but it could be. And Suku's not too far from here and he's just on Chitwa and we are pretty much on Chita cut line so distance wise could be that they were together portion of the night and then they split it up and, and Suko went and terrorized in Ghana and then she's just now looking for the rest of the pride could be an explanation as to why she's by herself 
Seems like Tingana is not looking... No, no, we're not going to Tingana. We're staying with <laughs> the lioness. There was a bit of a glitch in the system there. She hasn't stopped calling. Now, there's quite a difference in between the roar that we heard and Suku make this morning. Just, I think that was pure and utter frustration on his behalf. And the call that she is making. I wonder if she heard more lions. Hmm, why are you gazing around? Definitely not anymore. Right, I think I'm gonna try and just go a little bit forward and give us maybe a bit of a different angle, although this one is fantastic, but I think the one that I've got in mind might even work out a little bit better. So just bear with me for two seconds while we move our car. And we're still not gonna be in her way. Jimmy, you are asking how old do lions live for? Well, it depends if you're a boy or a girl. So lionesses tend to live slightly longer than what males do. They tend to live roughly on average until they're maybe 15, 16 years of age. And then the male lions, because they're constantly fighting, then they live until they're about 12. Now, by constantly fighting, I mean they lead a more violent life than some of the females because not only do they have to hunt and fight for the right to mate with the females but they also have to hold territories and that means spending off all other male lions that might come around and sometimes those fights can get very very violent so in general male lions tend to live a little bit less than when female lions do now in captivity they are known to live over 20 years or so i have a feeling maybe the rest of your pride is up there that's where we saw the tracks. So perhaps you need to carry on walking. Maybe she's getting frustrated because nobody's answering. <laughs> I love it that she's gone up a termite mound just like a leopard. <laughs> we couldn't find Tandy, but at least the lions like us, Senzo. <laughs> Kristen, you're wondering if Nsuko is close enough to hear her. Well, he's close, but not that close. She would have to make a bit of a louder sound. If she started roaring, for example, then yes, he would definitely hear her, even if the wind is not that favorable to her at the moment. But he, their hearing is a lot better than ours, so they can, it, and also the noise can travel very, very far away. So if there are any other lions in the close vicinity, I would say, and, Probably about 5k radius or so, they can, de they should be able to hear her. Seems like our leopard is finally camera ready, so let's go over to Tristan and ask him if Tingana or Nsuku can hear the lioness. No, I don't think so, Ali. I think that lioness is a little far away and far too windy for her to be making any sort of impact on these two. Neither one of them have put, put their heads up and looked in that direction, so highly doubt either one is hearing that line is calling. It's interesting though because this morning, for those of you that were watching, we were talking about those tracks that were on the cut line saying it was just for one lioness. So I wonder if maybe the rest are somewhere inside Torchwood and she's calling and they're just ignoring her. It wouldn't surprise me at all. We have a situation where often you know, some of the sub-adults don't answer the female and, and, and that's how it goes. I was initially thinking maybe that that single track might have been for that Imbiri female, which is, for those of you who missed it, there was a lioness that showed up, when was it, two days ago, three days ago, Fergus? When did we have her? I think it was two, three days ago, somewhere around there. And she kind of moved around and she's on her own. She's come all the way from the Manyadeti. So we thought for a second maybe it might be her, but it seems as though it's the Nkumas. Now, Tingana is still resting. He's taking it easy. In fact, he was so relaxed just now, he almost fell out of the tree. It was very funny to watch. His whole head fell off the branch and he had to grab himself with his left leg. He was fell into this deep, deep, deep sleep. And he got a bit of a fright when the vehicle arrived and he kind of almost rolled off the branch. It was quite funny. So, Joy, you're wondering about how old Tingani is and what his age is. So, Joy, he is now approaching 12 years old, well, around 12 years old. So, he's a little bit older. And, and for a male leopard, 12 is, is generally around 
the the age that they start declining in terms of their condition so he's a well-aged male um, and he's you know he's getting into that time where he could potentially start to um, you know lose condition so it's it's not unexpected for him to start declining a little bit but he's just done it so fast that that's what makes it very concerning what I will tell you about Tingana and his condition is that for some reason he, he looks quite tatty so he's he doesn't look as thin as I would expect him to look and as for the way that people have been re reacting about him even yesterday but he does look tatty if you look at his fur even around his neck his face there's lots of little pitting and scarring and so I wonder if he's just been a bit under the weather maybe he's had a bit of mange to deal with I don't know it's just kind of might have made you know life a bit tough you can see a few scars on his coat there around his armpits and you know Tingana was always in a leopard especially in the last few months it looked really good he always had his coat was always in good condition and you know coats will actually deteriorate if they're not getting enough good food but I mean he is a little on the skinnier side but he definitely does have a belly full of food there that's why he's breathing quite quickly it's it, and he hopefully will be this will be him turning the corner back to that impressive male that we all know he is when he's well fed and doing his thing so I really think that he's a an individual that can bounce back from this and I, I feel like he has a couple years left in him and so hopefully he'll be able to kind of turn it around and a, a few good meals in a row and you'll be surprised at how quickly a leopard can be look good again I and mean, we've seen it with lions countless times we've seen it I've seen it with leopards countless times as well where they start to look a little bit horrid and then they start getting a good string of meals together and it's as though they never had anything wrong with them so hopefully that's going to be the case of Tingana and you know his age is not going to to be get the better of him just yet it's interesting because you know we always used to refer to Mvula as the old man but actually Mvula is not that much older than Tingana is anybody a year older than Tingana and so you know we, we've just seen Mvula go through this massive decline as well and get very very skinny and so you know Tingana I suppose it's to be expected that he's going to start to deteriorate at some point like I say that what's caught everyone by surprise is the fact that he went from very healthy to to a bit skinny in in no time and it, it indicates that something's not quite right the fact that he also hasn't been maintaining his territory as well as he used to and we know Tingana used to be a male that really looked after his territory very well and that's why he was so su uh, successful but you know the fact that he hasn't been maintaining his territory as well as he should is also an indication that maybe something's not been quite right maybe he's had a you know an issue internally it, it does happen sometimes that they do get these things I know when Saleh died she was also quite a shock death and there was lots of internal things that were found with her so she had you know internal bleeding lesions in the lungs um, she had an inflamed I think it was an inflamed spleen. So there was a there was a number of different things, you know, wrong with, with this animal and and so that could be the same with Tingana. They could you know, he could have had a fight, he could have been chased by lions and fallen out of a tree, he could have done all kinds of things and could have had a situation where he got injured quite badly and that's why, you know, he's he's been kind of recuperating and trying to hide under the radar but as soon as he gets the strength back and hopefully deals with whatever it is and, and can process that then I'm hoping he's going to become an individual that will be able to move around again and, and once again be the dominant male and keep Hukumuri at bay. He's got so many cubs now to look after that he really needs to step up for another year. Just one more year out of Tingana will be a massive kind of saviour in terms of the, the going forward of, of the leopards in this area. Kuchava we know has got this one little cub now. Tandy's got the one little cub. Shadow and her cub. So those three females which are all in his area are relying on him to try and start getting right and trying to start getting into the and you know you know hoping that he kind of keeps Hukumuri at bay and any other leopard for that matter so it's going to be interesting to to see how it goes but I'm glad he's in the tree at least with a kill I mean it's it's good news I'm pretty sure Nsuku is going to give him trouble so what I think we're going to do there's a number of vehicles that want to come here so what I think we might do is just go now while they're both sleeping and then we'll get back into the lineup and try and come here towards the end of the drive and hope that Nsuku's up and maybe we can get some interaction of what's going to go on and play out unfortunately we can't keep everybody out there's I think seven or eight other vehicles that want to come in here and so we need to help and you know share the sighting with everybody else that's also in these areas good so while we carry on we're going to go probably back towards ship to dam we'll just drive around a little bit see what else we can find and in, in the time that we do that let's send you back across to byron who i'm sure is still beaming from his epic african harrier hawk sighting i really am tristan i love that that's something i've never seen before never seen a hairy hawk 
catch a scorpion. Um, and I, I actually didn't know they fed on scorpions, so that is really interesting. Uh, I enjoyed that very, very much. I hope you did too. Sounds like uh, both Ali and Tristan have had luck with cats this afternoon, which is great. We're just driving still through quite a thick area at the moment. Trying to find anything interesting and I think it was, was it Ellie? Um, sorry Rebecca, was it, oh Billy, sorry, I do apologize. Billy, you want to see flowers and I'm going to look for some flowers. There's a little water buck just moved through there. However, I saw something move onto this termite mound around the back. I'm hoping it comes out again. Let's just wait and see for a few minutes. There it is. There it is. A little dwarf mongoose. They are just too curious. They can't stay away from watching us. And this is definitely one of my favorite little creatures we get out here. I find them so cute. Really beautiful. Now, usually there would be a lot more of them. I'm just trying to look for movement. Um, I think bottom left of the termite mound. Is that something moving there? No. No, that is a piece of... Mud, that is not a dwarf mongoose. There he is again. Smelling, look at that nose, twitching as it smells. As I was saying, they're very gregarious, which means always in large family groups. <laughs> Kathy, you say peekaboo. <laughs> I suppose you could, you could imagine a dwarf mongoose saying that as it sticks its head up and watches us with those beady eyes. But they are very cute. Now, I don't know where the rest are. I can't see any others. I can hear them though. I can hear them calling. They've got a very interesting little alarm call. It sounds something like that. My dwarf mongoose alarm call is not very good. I do apologize. <laughs> We can maybe ask Tristan if he can give us his rendition of it. So that's just warning the other mongoose that we are around. See how that one is keeping a close eye on us. Now there's also a good chance that they probably live in this termite mound. They do use abandoned mounds as homes. They burrow underground and they stay there in their family group. Very, very curious. Uh, now, we've got a dwarf mongoose on a termite mound, but the lioness that Ellie has been following is apparently on a termite mound too. Yes, she is, and she is loving it. Nothing as comfortable as a termite mound to sleep in. <laughs> Now, it seems like she's not that bothered by where the rest of her pride is now. I think maybe she just woke up and realized she was by herself. And she's been trying to contact call every now and again, but I think she is very confident in the fact that at one point or another, she's actually going to find them. So definitely not worried. She's still up there and very happy to be sleeping. It's quite a obvious place to sleep, but I suppose lions out of all the animals around, they have the luxury of sleeping wherever they want. So what? Just taking advantage of it and she's got some massive paws as well I'm always impressed when we see them just how big they are you know they just command so much power hmm. I do wonder where the rest of your pride is because we've been playing games with them the whole well between yesterday and today well, I suppose we can call it the whole day because that would be 24 hours of me running around trying to find either either a leopard or a lion on Juma at least because this morning we got lucky because Nsuku and Tingana were spotted by the Chitwa guys <laughs> not bothered at all are you there's a slight breeze and it seems that almost in the background the clouds are starting to open and I can see 
a beautiful blue sky for the first time in about of two days. So she's actually, we apologize for the poll. We are still with our roofs on because we're not too sure as to what the rain is going to be doing in the next few days. But at least for now, it's a lovely, lovely sky. And I wouldn't be surprised if she's sleeping and tired because probably she was awake and she slept very uncomfortable I would say until 8 o'clock in the morning because it drained throughout the night so I doubt that any animal had a good night's sleep. It's time to make up for it now in full lion fashion. <laughs> Beautiful clouds. Now I wonder if Tandy is around here as well because we had those alarm calls not too far and we couldn't, we drove in to check it out and there was nothing so I'm starting to get suspicious as if to maybe there was another lion down there or if perhaps actually Tandy because it's not too far from the spot where Byron found her but who knows it seems like in the last few days lions and leopards have been almost dancing around each other and I wouldn't be surprised if she is somewhere around here Nelia, you're wondering if a spider can get sick from, sorry, if a lion can get sick from a spider bite. Uh, I would suppose that depending on the spider, sometimes they can, their venom can make a wound necrotic. So if it does manage to actually get through their skin and through their hair and inject their venom, they might, it might happen and might be able to. Although I don't think it would be deadly for a lion. Maybe it will make them feel ill for a little while, but I think they would overall survive. I'm not too sure. I've never heard of a lion being uh, or dying because of a spider bite. I have heard of lions dying because they've been bitten by snakes before, but never a spider. But I suppose as with everything, if it's a very big, mean, very venomous spider, perhaps now. That is a Franklin in the distance that started making that call that got her up and scanning the horizon again. Hmm. It is funny, just she seemed to be very fast asleep and as soon as something felt out of place and the Franklin made its noise and her head was up very quickly, not in too much alert because the Franklin is not that close to us, but then just calling just in case there's somebody around. I feel your struggle. I, I wish that, you know, at least one of them would reply to you. Such a sad call. Please get very much to Answering now. Oh. A little bit louder. I'm trying to listen out as well, very intently, see if perhaps we can pick up another lion answering far in the distance, but I cannot hear anything. Sensor, can you hear anything? Not. Also, I cannot hear anything. It is windy as well, so that might be a reason why we can't see anything. Seems like Tristan is cloudscaping, if I'm not mistaken. So let's head over to him and find out if maybe he found the rest of the lion pride in the clouds. No, Ali, no lion pride in the clouds, I'm afraid. If I was looking there, we're going to have a bit of a problem. but. You can see a very, very pretty scene unfolding. The sun has broken through a little bit and big storm clouds kind of rolling in underneath them. And so you've got this dark coloration against that very light sky. And Fergus is doing an absolutely sterling effort. And it really is very pretty. It's absolutely amazing. So 
nice to just sit sometimes and appreciate just the sky and see how that is and you can see there's beams of light that are being shone upon all over the place and it looks like something is coming from that area and going to invade us here at Nchitwa Airstrip. Luckily though I don't think there is actually anything and so we're perfectly safe. There's also a few impalas that are bouncing around that are very chilled with life. They kind of slowly going to cross the airstrip and head in this direction which will be quite nice as well. So very nice all in all. Billy, age five, flowers, nothing exciting right around me right now. But Billy, I do know a spot here on the airstrip where there are some time. In fact, Billy, I've got your flowers just for you. Lots of impalas, which I'm sorry, I'm going to chase the impalas a little bit to go and get Billy's flower. So hold on, Billy, I'm going to go get a flower. You watch the impalas so long while I go get the flower and enjoy those. I might be quiet for a little bit, so enjoy the impalas and the sunset. And I'm going to walk over here to get the flower that Billy wants to see. Sorry, impalas, I didn't mean to scare you. But the impalas are shouting at me, so if you're wondering why they're alarm calling, that's because of me and they're running the wrong way because they're about to run straight towards Tingana and Nsuku. Good, Fergus. We have flower. We have succeeded in our operation. Now I need to just plug myself in so that I can talk to Rebecca, otherwise she's going to shout at me and we don't want to be shouted at at all. Good, 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 good. Right, Billy. You wanted a flower, so I've got you the flower that I can find the closest one that is in this area. And it is a very, very, very pretty flower. You can see it is a nice little pink flower, Billy. So not very nice with the tire behind it. I do apologize, but hopefully Fergus can blur that out and we'll just have a nice dark background for our beautiful pink flower. Now this pink flower belongs to what is called a devil thorn. Now devil thorn doesn't have a really pretty name, does it, Billy? It's not as pretty as you would think, so you want it on there, Fergus? Uh, maybe, maybe. Oh, well, Fergus, you're asking a lot because it's going to shake in the wind, but I'll try. There we go. I don't think it's going to work. Okay, Fergus, well, like I say, it's going to blow over. And the reason why it's going to blow over, Billy, is because the name that it's been given is because of this right here. So let me get rid of this in the front. That is a seed pod for the devil thorn. And so it's gotten the name because of the two little points on top that look like a devil's horn. So let me turn it for you so you can see what I'm talking about. There we go. You see? It's got two little horns on top, and so that's where it gets its name from. Now, this plant grows often on the edges of roads and runways, um, of like an airstrip, and any area that's been disturbed heavily by a lot of animals. And so it creates a ground cover and is very common in these kind of areas. But this plant is absolutely amazing, Billy. It's one of my favorite plants for a couple of reasons. The first thing is that this plant is very cool to use out here in the bush. So we've got a number of plants that are medicinal or have some sort of use that we can do something with, Billy. And this one I'm going to show you has a very, very cool thing that you can do. Now I need my water bottle for this because I need to make it wet before I can do anything else. So I've got to just hold it out there. Let's sprinkle some water on there. There we go, a little bit of water. Now cold water is not ideal because it makes the hands cold, but a little bit of warm water would be absolutely perfect, Billy. Nice bit of warm water is what you need for this plant. And so what you'll do is you'll wet it like that, and then you're going to take it, and you make, make sure that there's no thorns on it, Billy, because otherwise you're gonna hurt yourself. And then you rub it together, right? And you keep rubbing, and you rub, and you rub, and you rub, and you rub, and you keep rubbing like this and what's going to happen is it's going to start going very very slimy and it's going to get a little bit of slime on it can you see the slime there like if I open my fingers you can actually see a little bit of it on that area so this is all slimy because this plant is a natural soap or shampoo so if I was dirty Billy I would take this and I would rub it and I'd be able to get myself nice and clean what they also use this for is because it makes the slime you can take it and you can rub it on your arm 
and like this and it creates a barrier on your arm from the sun and so it can also be used as a type of sun cream which is very very cool so the devil thorn even though it's got a nasty thorn on it it is very useful for all of us now some people out here Billy who are not very nice people at all they also used to use this plant for something a little more evil and what they used to do is they used to take this pod here and they would take this little thorn and they would put it on the step of someone that they didn't like or someone that they wanted to murder and they would put it on the step and they would put poison on these little thorns on the front and the person would step out of their room and they would step on this and it would go into their hair or into their foot and that would poison them and they could die from it so it was a way that they used to kill people way back when it's a very sinister thing to do but that's what they used to do with it which is pretty crazy so it's a very useful plant even though it has a very pretty flower it can be used for both good and bad things so like that's why I like this plant it's got lots of different things it can be used for but there we go there's a flower for you Billy I hope you enjoyed it it's nice always to see flowers and hopefully we're gonna get a lot more flowers over the next few weeks because of the rain all right let's get rid of this did you say X tills or X kills Rebecca I'm gonna think about this now because I can't really hear very well F tool, there we go. Okay, sorry, Rebecca. It's, it's, my hearing's not very good, as coupled with the fact that Jigger has not the best comms at Chitwa, makes for these mistakes. So I do apologize, F tool. But you want to know about conifer's plants and whether or not we get any like the Venus flytrap? Not that I've see, know about here in the Sabi Sands. So we don't have any plants that are actually capturing insects and digesting them. Um, we don't have any of those kind of things out here. We have, I think, far too many insects that live on most of our plants that do that already. So the plants would probably lose out more than anything else. But it's not that I know of, no, unfortunately. It would be really cool if we had an African version of like a trumpeter flower or a um, Venus flytrap. I think that'd be very cool. Right. Let's throw that away. And. Ah, right, Billy, you are probably an absolute champion because Billy says thanks for the flower and here is a leopard in return and he sent me a little leopard emoji on Twitter. So thank you, Billy, that's very kind of you. Hopefully we will get another leopard for not only me but for all of you as well. And I'm glad you enjoyed the flower. I will look out for more, Billy, so don't go anywhere. I'll try and see if I can find some more flowers while we kind of meander about Chitwa. I'm sure there are some. I I'm going to look for a flower flower that is very similar to, well, it's got the same name as the animal that Ali's got. So while I try and find that flower, let's send you back to Ali and you can see what animal she has. Well, she's definitely not gone back to sleep um, after the Franklin woke her up and she's been soft content calling still. Now, I'm tempted to go and look around where in the direction where she is looking in, but I'm afraid that if we leave her, we might not find her again. So it's a bit of a tricky one. I do know that one of the other vehicles has gone all the way up north and just wants to check around. So hopefully if they find anything, they will let us know. Also, I'm a bit hesitant of leaving her because if she does come across the lions and the greeting ceremony in a pride once they find each other and they haven't seen each other for a while is very very special I love it when they start and they see each other and there's almost a hesitation in the beginning is this somebody I know should I run away and then how they just rub their heads and start making calls and become almost a little bit playful definitely actively searching for all your pride I wish they would answer Yeah, they're not being that nice to you, are they? I think you are looking in the wrong direction, though. Perhaps if you roar a little bit louder. Maybe not too much energy yet. We all know that you can roar louder than that. Perhaps you won't be able to roar as loud as one of the males, but definitely can go 
a couple decibels higher than what she's doing now. So it's interesting. It, it keeps me wondering as to why she's making soft contact calls like that. So it's either because she doesn't want to give her position away too much. She doesn't want to actively advertise that she's here. Or perhaps she believes that the rest of the pride is not that far. Obviously, there's communication clues that are left behind when animals go by that are pretty much impossible for us humans to detect. And these are the olfactory pheromones and things that are up in the air, but as well, um, any other what's the word for it any other sounds any other noises perhaps lions are replying far away and she can just almost hear a faint call all right seems like we've got some elephants that might be entering the scene we've been very lucky with intraspecies in the last few days now she's definitely looking at them and they're straight ahead of us and they're almost coming this way and it's a mother and a youngster about two four months old now you see she's raised her trunk. She can definitely smell the lioness. She knows she's here, but I think she's just going to try and avoid her. Yeah. Well, if you wanted to go and notice, that didn't help. <laughs> now the elephants are both listening in this direction. They know there's a lion here. Very alert, you see how her ears are all perked like that. Welcome everyone. We are coming to you all the way from South Africa. We're in the Greater Kruger National Park. We are watching a herd, a small herd of elephants. It's just in front of us. My name is Ali and Senzo is on camera with me today. But we want to show you the beautiful lioness that we are looking at. That's also looking at the elephants. Now if you've got any questions or comments, please post them on the comment section below. This is live and interactive, so what we're looking at is exactly uh, at what is happening right now. Now we've got this lioness that seems to have lost her pride. She's making a soft contact call. She wants to know where the rest of her pride is. And unexpectedly, we've had these elephants that have joined the scene. So it's been a bit of a tricky one because the elephants, they've kept coming and they're coming down the road. It seems it's only three of them for now. And they're coming here, but they seem to just carried on feeding they definitely know that the lioness is here you can see their ears are pert and before when she was making those calls they stopped and they put up their trunks and then they were smelling everything around us so both animals both species know that the lion the lion knows the elephants are here and the elephants know that the lioness is here now i think it would be a bit of a different situation if the whole pride was here Stephen, you're saying hello from Houston. Well, hello from South Africa. It's wonderful to have everyone joining us from different parts of the world to witness a very unusual encounter between lion that we've got here on the right hand side and then the elephants. And now I cannot see any more lions and she's been desperately calling for the for her pride for the last 15 minutes or so. I think, yeah, there she's calling. Just gonna be quiet for about five seconds. Maybe she's gonna call again because it's a very faint noise that she's making. Lions can make obviously much louder calls, they normally roar, but in this case, I think she's just holding her ground. She doesn't want to leave that termite mound, but you see now that the elephants are starting to approach a little bit, it's almost like she's. Well, besides the fact that she's gone almost to sleep, she's put her shoulders or her head a little bit further down. And if the elephants carry on coming, perhaps she's going to go flat on the termite mound, almost in a submissive behavior to try and avoid them. However, right now, doesn't seem like she's too worried. <laughs> the elephants have veered off a little bit and have put a massive line of trees between them and the lioness. So... I apologize for the pulls. These are for the rain that we've had 
Tamara, you're wondering if this is the Yankahuma Pride. I do believe this is one of the females of the Yankahuma Pride. And we had tracks for them this morning and we've been looking for them for the last two days and only now have we managed to find one of the females. Now you see the elephant seems that it's going to veer off and going to head in a different way. Morali, you're wondering if the cub is nearby. We haven't seen any cubs. We've only seen this lioness. So we're not too sure where the rest of the pride is or where the cubs are being hidden at the moment. I think the elephants are going to try and avoid all sort of confrontation. They have now veered off onto the bushes, into the thickets far away from where the lioness is. And the lioness has held her ground in a very sleepy fashion. I think more because she's asleep than because she, more than that, she wasn't really trying to be too fierce. And she's just sleeping now. I'm going to stick around with this lioness for the foreseeable future. If you'd like to carry on watching and see what happens next, you're welcome to search Safari Live and subscribe. Right, apologies everyone for all the little gremlins that were attacking us and just pretty much wanted me to keep quiet. Can you guys hear that? I think she's definitely starting to get annoyed now. And she's becoming louder. Now, it's amazing to see just how close those elephants and the lion were, and often it'll happen in, I think perhaps, oh, you, okay, I'm not gonna interrupt if you're calling. getting more of that so now it's a fine line now we're in in between roaring and <laughs> calling I think now the patience is waving thin and I wouldn't blame her she's been calling now for a while and absolutely no answer from everyone how very rude of the rest of her family now as I was saying earlier I think one of the most amazing things is just to witness this interaction constantly are you going to roar again mm -hmm. Right, sorry guys, I want to keep quiet as much as I can because the noise that she's making, um, it's amazing and we don't get to hear it all that often and I just want everyone to be able to enjoy what partly of what the bush is really about. It's just sitting still and hearing everything that's around you and just allowing everything just to play out just just pretty much admiring i think i'm pretty besotted by the scene and the beautiful sky that we've got at the back and the spot that she chose where to lie in and just in general the way that we've seen her behavior change and even her calls in the last little while she's gone from you know very confident that the pride was all around her calling softly to getting a little bit sleepy on the termite mount to now it seems getting a little bit annoyed because nobody's answering 
No, I'm sure the rest of her pride is fine. I just think they might be a little bit further away than what she initially thought. Now we're almost into roaring. Such a powerful sound. Uh, since uh, I think we today we hit the, the roaring jackpot. <laughs> we really have. It's been very lucky just to have the male roaring in the morning and now her and just being able to share it with everyone. But just to finish on my last train of thought, if you will allow me, I would appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's amazing how close um, animals often are to each other, predators to potential prey species, and they just choose to avoid each other. The lioness didn't even move. At one point she seemed she was a little bit sleepy, and then the elephants just decided to veer off and go away from her. <laughs> like that lion sleeping fashion with the paw. I don't know if I could even imitate that, like sleeping like this. <laughs> First lady, you're wondering if the lions ever damage their vocal cords from roaring so loudly. Well, they could potentially, but they're, they, what we hear, it's pretty much the sound just reverberating and their vocal cords are not exactly like ours. They're actually different. They're more of a square shape and protected by a fatty layer. And when they bring the air in, actually their diaphragm is put in, in such a certain position that it's able to grab, it's almost like more air and pull further back and then when the air comes out it resonates and on that fatty layer on their vocal cords because as far as I understand it our vocal cords are more of a triangular shape and theirs are more fatty res residues on the sides that allows this noise combined with um, the ability almost to pull a diaphragm back more than what uh, any of us could and this is a reason why they're able to roar so loudly without actually damaging their vocal cords or pretty much any parts of them. Now I think maybe we've gone back to sleeping. Frustration has settled in. <laughs> Um, PT Watcher, you're wondering what would happen if her family doesn't show up. Well, a couple of things could happen. She could become a nomadic lioness. She could stay around this area. But uh, likely her family will will come around and will be somewhere around this area. Now, she is part of a big pride of lions. It's about, I think, 13 at the moment. So the chances of her family completely disappearing in this particular area are very slim. So in the meantime, while she's by herself, she's just going to have to fend for herself. So that means hunting by herself, which I'm sure she's more than capable of doing, finding her own water. But also she knows the, um, the coalition of males that lives in this area, the Birmingham boys. So they will be able to recognize her and she will be able to recognize them. So as long as she's around and she stays within also the territory of these males, then she's got pretty much no reason to, to fear other than perhaps getting a little bit lonely with the lack of sisters and and nieces and nephews and all of the other family members. Although it seems like for now she's decided she's mad at all of them and she's just gonna sleep it off. That's the lion way. If you're angry, just sleep it off. <laughs> she's been so interesting to spend this afternoon with her. And also, I, do, I don't understand how cats, lions and leopards can get to themselves into these positions. I can just imagine trying to sleep with my arm sticking out like that, and I'm pretty sure that I would have a dead arm after a while. Now, imagine something that weighs about 180, 200 kilograms, <laughs> all the weight on one of their shoulders. Quite crazy. Hmm. Are you waking up? No. Byron is at one of the pans. I wonder which one. Maybe he's got some lion tracks that he can show us. So let's head over to him and find out what he's been seeing. Well, for the moment, Ali, I can't see anything, but listen to the sound around me.
we have got surround sound of bubbling casinas. Beautiful little frogs. Unfortunately, I don't have a frog app like, uh, like Tristan does. We can maybe ask him to show you what a bubbling casino looks like later. James, you know what? I've never seen an African bullfrog. Um, I know uh, Tristan saw this morning. He saw one this morning, as he um, as he was on drive. But I unfortunately have never seen one. I don't know. I don't know why. And they're out there, and you hear them. I just haven't seen. Them. Uh, VM says he's going to show me where to find them. So we'll have a look. But what a wonderful sound! Keeping quiet a little bit because there's a beautiful sound. Also scanning the trees. I know some of you have asked to see an owl. I haven't seen a little owl or even heard a little owl for quite some time. <laughs> Bubbling casinos are so loud. It's so strange. I can't see a single frog anywhere. I'm looking carefully, but they're obviously well hidden in the grass or possibly just lying in the water and sticking their heads up and calling. Amazing sounds. All right, let's go up ahead. Just have a look and see what else we can find. Maybe a bullfrog somewhere. That would be great. So I thought I saw a bird fly into this tree. I just want to have a look here quickly. I always try and do a bit of bird. Gemma, um, do you know what? The frogs don't only call in the in the early morning or at night. Um, they are more active around that time. However, they do call during the day too from time to time, depending on if it's nice and cool and if there's a lot of water around. Um, you, will, you will hear them calling during the day. But, yeah, they get more active around about now. And these bubbling casinos all over. They, in, in front of us there. Sure. Can I tell you, I was confused by a, a call for some reason. It just confused me completely and I thought, but I know what bird was calling. It was making a lot of noise. You might have heard it. Um, <laughs> all it, it was a woodland kingfisher, another call of the woodland kingfisher. It's so funny at times you overthink things. You're like, what bird is that? It's a different call. I haven't heard it for a while. It's just a woodland kingfisher and the different call that it does. Now it sounds like Ellie has had an amazing sighting of that lioness and elephant. I am quite jealous. But she's still with that lioness. Don't know if she's contact calling anymore. It sounds like she's resting. Let's go and see what she's up to. She is resting now. I feel like she's given up for the time being. And it's tough being a lion. You've got to sleep a lot just to keep up with your reputation, I suppose. <laughs> she is looking very sweet. And I must say, out of... Throughout this whole sighting, I think the general feeling or at least the general impression that she's given me is just sort of a very sweet character that's looking very sadly for the rest of her family. First lady, you're wondering if... I'm sorry about the use of the word wondering. I'm trying really hard to stay avoid, to avoid it, but it doesn't seem like I can. <laughs> you are asking if the lions get worried like uh, the humans do. Well, I 
think that they do just in my experiences how they've uh, I've seen them react to certain situations and certain conditions and they they do definitely get apprehensive about things so you can feel that there is almost an unease and an unsettlement in their character um, I don't know if you've ever seen it on one of our shows, but for example, we're in either lions or leopards when they're thinking or when they're approaching a kill, you can almost, especially with leopards, it's very obvious, you can see their tail that starts flicking or when they're stressed and they're looking for a cub and the cub doesn't come running, then you can feel that tension that, um, that they're feeling. So definitely, I do think that they get worried, perhaps not for the same reasons as what we do and they may not carry their worry the same way as we do but I think in their own terms yes they they do feel worry although not like you are too worried now that you're asleep maybe earlier when your pride wasn't wasn't answering but I think that was perhaps a mix between worry and anger and frustration <laughs> but you're very pretty now even with the fly on your ear <laughs> looking in such great condition as well um we've always been impressed with the Inkahuma pride just because they tend to look so they're like pretty lions they're like wedding cake lions always very pretty in good conditions always looking stunning and they're a pleasure to see some of the other lions that we get in certain areas and even i'm sorry to say this but if we compare them to the stick sprites the stick sprite unfortunately because they've had certain skin conditions and diseases they're not looking as pretty but it seems that somehow the ankohumas always manage to pull through and and look stunning now I'm curious to sometime witness the Torchwood Pride. I would like to see them and see what they look compared to the sticks in the Enkohumas. That that would be quite an unusual comparison. It would give us an idea of what pretty much the three main prides of lions or lionesses that we get in this area look like. You are out. Hopefully not for the next few minutes. I am hoping that her calls got someone moving and that it'll be come this way. But while we wait for her to either get up, let's head over to Byron who's at his next water hole looking for more frogs. Uh, I'm trying to listen to some more For the moment, it's mainly bubbling casinos. Um, can you hear anything else? It sounds like some painted reed frogs. Very high pitched sound, paint, beautiful painted reed frogs. I can hear. And there are some other little ones calling, which I'm not sure of. Ali and I were both very impressed with um, with Tristan's frog call knowledge this morning. Um, we think he secretly lies in bed at night and plays the, um, the frog calls on repeat. That's the other one that... Very faint, I think. I think that's a tremelo sand frog, if I remember from this morning with Tristan saying that I can't remember we're gonna we're gonna have to ask him just to play some of those again for us but bubbling casino um, definitely the um, um, oh, I've got a blank now bubbling casino and painted reed frogs definitely and there's that other one that brrr, I think we must just ask Tristan what that is again Cenac you asked if there are any frogs that burrow into the ground or into the dirt yes the bullfrogs a perfect example of one of those they do burrow in underground sometimes they do sleep there until the rains and then they dig their way out again First lady, you asked, do all the frogs have the same life cycle? Yes, lay eggs, tadpole, and then eventually frog, uh, frog or toad. So yes, they do have the same life cycle. That woodland kingfisher is calling again to my left. You might be able to hear it. That high-pitched. There we go, the woodland kingfisher. 
I was so confused earlier. It's so funny how at times you just forget um, a, a certain call, but it is a woodland kingfisher. Is that a bullfrog? Let's just listen to some of these calls around us again. I'm going to keep quiet for a short while. That is the sound of a Land Rover that you can, sorry, a Land Cruiser that you can hear when the other guides moving past. Now oh, with these beautiful frog sounds that we can hear, uh, let's head across to Tristan now who's got Tingana still up in a tree. And maybe he can shed some light on some of these frog calls for us. Well, Byron, I would love to shed some light on your frog calls. I just don't know what they sound like. So you'll have to you'll have to do them for us, and then I'll have to listen to them and see how accurate you are. But I know this morning if. Byron is around Twin Dams, which I think that's where he is. I know that this morning I had ornate frog, I had banded rubber frog, there was tremolo sand frog, there was banded rubber frogs, there was bullfrogs, and you'll probably find that this evening you probably get some golden leaf folding frogs calling, and maybe even the water lily frogs too. So there'll be some of them, and you might even get some common cacos calling as well and I don't know what else there might be some others there we'll go and maybe on the way home have a look but we'll be with Tingana for a while so you can see he's kind of moving around in the tree he's just trying to get himself settled the male lion in Suku is still taking it very easy now he's a bit I mean he's not what Tingana should be in terms of his size he's definitely a skinnier leopard than what he was a few months ago and he needs to put a lot more bulk on but meals like this are going to go a long way into him feeling much better about life and so hopefully he's this is going to be the trigger to get him back in and kind of rearing to go but he is a little bit doddery and a bit kind of on the skinnier side of things which is which is not how you kind of picture Tingana whenever I close my eyes I always see Tingana as this big hefty male leopard and so hopefully like I say he'll restore himself back to that former glory in some ways I mean he, obviously he's going to be aging and his, his face and everything else is going to show signs of age but I'm just hoping that he gets himself back into a situation where, he, you know, he just gets in some muscle and, and gains a bit of condition once again. We know with Mvula, Mvula went through a rough patch at one point as well where he got very skinny and then kind of bounced back from that. So hopefully Tingana will be the same. But he's still got that massive dewlap and neck area. So that's one thing he hasn't lost is his big dewlap. So Joy, you're wondering if we do... Oh, you see, I'm also catching myself, Joy. So I also have to apologize because I also got told off by Rebecca that I say wondering too much. Sorry, Rebecca. And Ali, I know, is talking about it just now. So both Ali and I have it on the brain. And, well, it's the way it goes sometimes. You'll have to all tell me what new word I can use. But, Joy, you are pondering. How about that, Rebecca? Can I use pondering? Is that better or not? Anyway, Joy was pondering. Now I've forgotten what Joy was pondering. <laughs> So Rebecca, you're going to have to tell me the question again, and I promise Rebecca is not a nasty human being. She was just telling us that we, we say it too often, and she's right. We, as presenters, get into these situations where we say words over and over again. So it's, it's, she's totally right in letting us know. Ah, there we go. So um, not on all the autopsies that... Um, that die. Um, some of the predators that die will have a situation where we know what happened to them. So let's say like that tailed lioness that is in um, that died on Londolosi. She died of old age and, and by the time they found her carcass there was really nothing left to do an autopsy on. But if it's something sudden like Salahesh then yes they do an autopsy on that because she just dies they don't really know the cause of it and when a, and an animal just kind of f f 
keels over and dies for no real obvious reason an autopsy needs to be done in case there's a disease that's spreading in case there's some sort of issue that they need to try and sort out and so that's when we'll get a situation where they do an autopsy so you know the animals that we can find we must remember that some of the animals we just never see any trace of them so you know there's there's certain leopards that have disappeared that we've never known what's happened to them or where they've gone um, Lamula is a case in point um, Lamula just disappeared out of this area and in all likelihood was killed and probably eaten before anyone even knew where he was and so that does happen from time to time as well so you know we'll see how it goes we'll see you know if if, if any of our our well-known leopards do kind of just you know pass away and, and they're not in any reason that we can see what's wrong with them then I'm sure an autopsy would be done Tingano, what are you doing? Why are you going to lie down, sit up? What's going on? He's a little bit kind of unsure. I think he just doesn't want to feed at the moment because feeding is going to attract attention of that male lion. Him moving around in the tree, maybe not so much, but as soon as he goes towards the carcass and tries to even eat, he's going to have a problem because that male lion is going to hear the crunching of the bones and it's going to make him a lot more interested. And so um, I think Tingano is just kind of hoping that in Suku grows tired of this whole situation and just gets up and walks off it and especially if there's a lioness contact calling that might call a little louder and Suku might hear it and go and investigate. I think that's what Tingan is banking on. He's obviously a very experienced campaigner. He's probably dealt with lions a lot more than we even realize and that's maybe why he's just sitting and waiting to see what happens. Now you will notice a light that is on Tingana, so for those of you that are not used to lights being on him, uh, the other game drive vehicles unfortunately don't have the capability to switch their eyes into infrared and therefore they can't just kind of see the leopard when it gets dark. They don't have the abilities that we do to be able to put infrared lights on and, and, and film. So they do use spotlights to be able to show what goes on at night. You'll see that most of the time though the, the light, the main source of the light will hit the chest of the animal or just around the feet and then the, the rim and periphery light highlights the face and that allows everyone to kind of see what's going on so they purposely will not shine into the eyes of as unobtrusive as possible so don't stress about the light it is something that is used out here all the time and and I've spoken to a vet about this funny enough and asked them about lights in the animals eyes and they say that with the cats there is actually no effect on them. Their, their eye is able to deal with it and, and while shining directly and is going to certainly be uncomfortable for them and they're going to close their eyes, the actual light and the ambience of that light is not affecting their vision going once you leave. It's not like one of the antelopes that if you shine into their eyes, the antelopes can have an effect where they can't see very well after you have shined the light, the cats for some reason, which I don't understand. He did give me a whole bunch of technical jargon uh, that their eye apparently responds much better to light and, and can react much quicker to changes in light. So apparently it's all okay and that's why it is still done. But like I say, you'll see that it's not going to be directly in his eyes which is always a good thing it's amazing though that we've come from that system we used to use lights and obviously we've tried to get more and more ethical and therefore we we're using the infrared stuff now patty he, he might relieve himself from the tree i have seen many leopards do it um, especially if there's something that's stopping them coming down he, you know, he might have a situation where he'll be able to sneak down and come and relieve himself out of the way of the lion. But any sort of noise of thudding onto the ground is going to bring in Suku to come and investigate. So probably fine, he'll just relieve himself up in the tree. Hopefully he doesn't decide to defecate from up there because that will be a bit of a mess, that's for sure. And we, we don't want to be under a marula tree that is already dropping marulas. We're taking a risk being under the tree itself because there's marulas hitting the ground at rapid rates around us and then flying poo would also not be ideal either so i think we'll hopefully give him a wide berth and if he does urinate or, or defecate that we're not in the firing line i think that's going to be a, a wise plan and one that we should adhere to now it looks like he's going to go in and feed let's see Tingana, are you going to try and feed no he's just going to position himself he's edging and wouldn't be surprised we start to see him so, sort of salivating at the thought and prospect of trying to have a little nibble while wow, that male lion is still kind of snoozing. Insuku looks as though he's fast asleep. I can't see him nicely, but he's on the airstrip and having a little bit of a nap. Right, now while he kind of contemplates what his next move is, whether or not he's going to go to another branch or have a little feed, let's send you back across to Ali, who I believe Lioness is off the mound and is starting to move.
Well, we all thought that she was going to because she stretched and she got up all of a sudden. But then just as quickly as she got up, then she went back down on the termite mound. <laughs> I think you're just playing with her feelings now. But her calls have become um, louder and louder as it's getting darker. And I think her patience as well as ours is running thin. We're all wondering where they are. Come on, guys. Now she... Okay. She carries on roaring this loud, then I'm sure the male lions are going to be able to pick up where she is. Perhaps Nsuko will be able to find out and get in this direction and probably try and join up for her. I have a feeling though that the rest of her pride is not as close as she thinks they are and I think they're a little bit further into Bufelsuk. Now this afternoon, are you going to carry on? I don't want to interrupt you, okay? Mm, okay, lady. So this afternoon as we were driving in this direction just to go and try and follow up on Tandy, we came across tracks for the big herd of buffalo once more. And they were in the central part of Juma, close to Gauri Dam. I'm not too sure if maybe they made an appearance by the dam camp. And then they carried on going north and east, at least from what I could see. So I wouldn't be surprised if the rest of them are actually on the trail of the buffalo as they've been the last few days. And perhaps, well, who knows? She got distracted doing other things, split up during the rain, and that's why she's by herself. Hampers, you're wondering if some animals track their prey by their footprints. Well, I don't think so, no. I think they will hunt them and they will follow their footprints because all the animals will leave a scent behind. And I think they go more by scent than by actually seeing the footprints. I don't think they'll, they'll be able to recognize if it's the footprint of a buffalo or, if, or a zebra, but they will definitely be able to recognize their smell. <laughs> Now we're talking. It's been an interesting comparison because in the morning we had a male lion roaring and now we have her and obviously in the morning the male lion was sounding a lot louder but this is still not as loud as she can go and it's still pretty loud so I think as the night carries on and if she doesn't manage to find her pride then we're gonna be able to hear her calling a lot a lot louder than what she is now. Sorry, Rebecca, can you just repeat the question once more? Um, Katerina, she might be more vulnerable during the night if she's by herself in case other, if she tries to hunt something bigger or if perhaps other unexpected lions come into the area. Just because one lion is more vulnerable that without just on itself than without the rest of of her pride, but I don't think she will she will get particularly scared. I think more than now she's just annoyed. Um, we're just gonna swap into infrared. So if you see the screen going into a bit of a different color, it's just because we're turning on our special lights that allow us to see better into the dark. Would probably allow us to follow you better into the dark should you decide to leave the termite mound. Nope. Are Lara more? Yes, the lions can recognize individual um, individual voices, individual lion calling, um, for sure. They are, and hyenas do it as well. And I think to some extent, leopards do it as well. When the one's calling, they will know exactly which pride member is calling because they all have different voices. Now, it seems a bit of odd for us, but if you think about it, when you're talking to someone, everybody's got a very specific voice and you're able to recognize people by their voice. It's pretty much exactly the same with the lions and 
the and the hyenas, which are the ones that tend to call the most, or at least live in clans where they knowing who's calling comes in beneficial. And you see, she's also raising her head. She's sniffing. She's she's sniffing. Right, seems like another one of our sleepy cats, Stingana, is contemplating on moving. So let's see. Will the leopard come down of the tree and start moving before the lion? Well, I don't think our leopard's going to come down from the tree. It looks as though he's going to pass out on his front legs and have a snooze again. He's got his little tongue out and he's doing his best hukumuri impression at this stage with his tongue hanging out like that. And he's almost kind of, like I say, he's got his legs draped over either side of the branch. It doesn't look as though he's going absolutely anywhere. It's almost like he's fallen asleep standing up. So, Tingana, why don't you get yourself more comfortable? If he just slid back slightly, he would be in a situation where he could actually just flop down and sit and watch from where he is. But at the moment, he's just kind of taking it very easy and sitting and almost just hoping that He'll stay standing while falling asleep by the looks of things. Now, Fergus, do you think we should move a little bit? I think maybe we should move. Maybe we can get at least his face in our shot rather than his bum. Although his hips look better. Just can you zoom in a bit on his hips there, Fergus, just for me? I just want to see how the muscle sort of situation is on his hips. A little skinny. A bit of a protrusion of his hips, but otherwise looking not too bad i mean it's better than i think what it was a few weeks ago or a few days ago should i say right well i'm going to move and i'm gonna see oh wait hang on tingana's moving i just wanted to see where he goes but i'll reposition so we can see his face and while i do that let's send you across to byron who's on the prowl for night crawlers don't worry yeah, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. I'm looking for chameleons, actually. I haven't seen a chameleon for a while. And uh, I'm trying to see if I can find one. But, um, and also owls. I really want to see an owl. But no sign. I haven't heard one yet. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, something slightly off the topic, which might be some of you might find a little funny but uh, this morning i had to sing a song in the tent james asked me to sing a song it was terrible night night crawler about the um earthworms and i just want to show you something over here so just have a look at the top of the phone is james henry's name there we go and then at the bottom if you read that message over there it says you are the greatest singer in the world thank you very much james i have got the proof it is in writing on my um on my phone so thank you james james has finally admitted it i knew he loved my singing i always knew it i always knew it <laughs> i just think that he is clearly very lonely at the moment in the mara and has probably spent too much time in the bush by himself. So perhaps he has lost it. That's the only, only, um... Oh, wait, look at, look at, a scorpion. In the bark of the tree. Look at that, can you see the pincers? I hope it doesn't move. Look at that. Now this is one of those tree creeping scorpion tree creeping scorpion apistacanthus asper that i think that um gymnogene or african harrier hawk caught earlier isn't that wonderful now that is not something you see every day nice to find it now there's a little bug very close to the hole if it moves any closer i'm sure that scorpion would try and grab with its pincers Oh, they just moved back in. I'm not going to bother the scorpion. Um, let's see if we switch off the light. Oh, there we go. Maybe, maybe that'll help with the infrared. And you can still see. Let me roll forward slightly. Sorry, VM. There. There, look at that. Beautiful view of the scorpion. And you can see, as I was saying, those very powerful pincers 
ready and waiting at the entrance of that little hole in the tree. So any uh, insect that crawls in front, the scorpion has got um, tiny hairs on the body and they're very sensitive. They can pick up the vibrations, they'll launch out very quick, capture the insect with the pincers and then often use the sting, sting it quickly and then feed. But these scorpions rely a lot on the power of the pincers to catch their prey. Wonderful. I love seeing these little creatures. We set out in search of interesting little creatures today, and I think we, we did pretty well. An interesting sighting with that African harrier hawk feeding on the scorpion, scorpion in the tree. And we still got a bit of time, maybe a last-minute chameleon. Maybe somebody finds one. Okay, now these scorpions would often feed on alates, and I was speaking about it this morning. Those flying termites, and Ali is apparently having a lot of them around her at the moment with the lioness. Right, well, she is definitely not moving. I don't know if this is her willing the pride to come to her or being too lazy to carry on looking for them. We're just making a statement now. It's quite an odd situation that we've witnessed today. I think you might have actually lost your pride. Has had anyone replied, she would have, I reckon she would have gotten up and carried on moving and just walked in that general direction. Direction. So perhaps even Suku does manage to steal the rest of the kill or just decides to abandon Tingana, which also would be wonderful as Tingana probably needs a bit of calm and rest and peace <laughs> maybe they would try and join up sometime during the night i wouldn't be surprised if they actually or if he hear her hears her from all the way down there if he comes up here to investigate as to who's calling or perhaps comes to say hello unless he's a reason why she got lost and then maybe she won't forgive him we can make our own little story and soap opera <laughs> Must be a very comfortable termite mount too, because she has not moved from that particular spot. You can also start hearing some of the night sounds besides the lion roaring. Seems like there are a few frogs around us, some bubbling casinas, some painted reed frogs in the distance. Everything happening now. Or nothing. <laughs> It seems like far in the distance, well not too far, but there are some elephants around. Mm. Are you going to call now? you want to chase the elephants away? Mm. Now the elephants are not too far, probably about the same distance as the other herd was in, but because everything is pitch black around us, we can't really see them, so I think we're just going to focus on her because her main interest is to see where she's going to go from here. If she goes south, likely she's going to be able to join with one of the Birmingham boys, although that would be quite far of your territory. You would be invading the sticks. I'm not too sure that's what you should do. Hmm. Jamie, I don't think hyenas will try to kill her when she's alone. Alone, They won't actively go after her and start hunting her and try to just get her out of the way and kill her. What could happen is if she bumps into more than one hyena, um, the hyena, well, there could be some aggression. But as we saw with the elephants earlier on, I think that likely if there's no food involved whatsoever in the equation, they will go their separate ways and try to avoid each other as much as possible. Normally when we have those conflicts between lions and hyenas and you see them fighting pretty much to the death, there are either little ones involved, in which case either the hyenas or the lions will protect their cubs, or there's some sort of meal that's in between. Either something that a lioness killed and the hyenas want to steal, or the other way around. Seems like 
both cats are in very similar positions, half standing, half asleep. So let's head over to Tingana and find out how he's keeping his balance. Now, he is keeping his balance. He's still in the exact same spot. I don't think he can decide what he actually really wants to do. Nsuku has not lifted his head in the entire time we've been here. He's still f absolutely fast asleep and taking it very easy. So he's obviously got the same syndrome that Ali's lion has got on the mound. So her mound is comfortable and apparently so is an airstrip if you're a lion. And Tingana, well, the tree looks as about as comfortable as is possible. So he's kind of uh, drifting off slowly into a slumber. And I wonder if maybe he's going to try and get a little bit of that food at some point. But it is that time, unfortunately, where we need to start heading home. There's also another couple of vehicles that do want to get in. We kind of snuck back in between everybody just so that we could be here for the end of our evening, which is hopefully going to be a delightful sort of thing for all of you and that you've enjoyed this afternoon. It seems to be a little bit of everything. There's been crazy stuff with the scorpion and the African Harrier Hawk. Obviously the lions and the leopards have also stolen the show. So from everybody, it's been an absolute pleasure and I hope that we will see you all tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari.